Welcome to the Terrible Podcast with your host from SteelersDepot.com, where you can find all your latest and greatest Steelers news. It's Dave Bryan and Alex Kazora, always lit, talking Steelers. And now, here's Dave and Alex. Welcome to the Terrible Podcast, Season 10, Episode 17. He's Dave Bryan. I'm Alex Kazora, SteelersDepot.com. Thanks for being with us this Friday, Steelers Nation. Dave, uh, we've got a lot to talk about today. Uh, we have an interview later in the show with Brady Henderson. He covers the Seattle Seahawks as a beat writer for ESPN.com. Uh, so just a heads up there. We'll have that a little bit later in the show, talking Seattle. But Dave, a lot to talk about today. How you doing? I'm doing good. Happy Football Friday. Uh, I'm I'm ready to get away a little bit more from that Patriots uh, yeah, uh, uh, all 22 tape. And uh, uh, you know, I know you've done a couple more film breakdowns on that. I I post a few more things, you know, on on Twitter and on the site as well too. Uh, you know, the more you get into that, the uh, I mean, it was ugly. There's no two ways around it, and you can't help a team like the Patriots uh, out the way the Steelers did by not converting those short yardage situations there. Uh, a few of the big plays, you know, going back uh, through through uh, uh, the, the game again last night uh, against the Patriots and seeing things like the uh, the the. The, uh, the pick penalty that was called on Deontay Johnson that negated a pretty big play by, you know, Juju Smith-Schuster. That was kind of a, uh, a disheartening, you know, development there. And uh, you got to be better all the way around. I mean, you, you're not going to beat the Patriots by by not doing the little things like that. Yeah, I mean, I think we've, we've talked about that game enough, and it's really just more of the same in terms of miscommunications and just poor execution and obviously issues on uh, third down. Uh, and even the offensive line struggle, we didn't talk about that a whole lot uh, in, in Wednesday's podcast. I thought Bill and Waver in particular had a really tough game, but not really no one along that O-line played particularly well. Like maybe Pouncey and DeCastro were the, the best two of the five. But, yeah, I mean, everyone obviously has to elevate their performance for week two. Uh, and Randy Feetner came out yesterday and said they were they were looking to maybe get uh, more of that pony in there, but uh, obviously got away from it. Uh, uh, you know, he he mentioned too, and Ben Ben alluded to it at the top of the week how that first, and I don't know why it, it, why he should have been spooked by that first failed third and one uh, run. You know, uh, I mean, the, obviously the next uh, the next two tries on those crack tosses, one, you know, why you would go back to the exact same play thinking you're going to, I mean, fool the Patriots once, great. You know, you know odds are that you know, you're not going to fool them twice uh, uh, on, on a play like that. And look, I mean, the uh, the other the other failed fourth down they should have had uh, to Dante Moncrief and all. Uh, but I, I did find it interesting that they were looking to get more of that pony backfield in there. Uh, uh, they they tried, I guess, twice in total. One of those plays uh, did not count due to a penalty. So officially, you got one play with that on the board right now. Yeah, I wasn't super surprised by it. I wrote about that and talked about that before uh, the Pats game that you had to do something different. I, I was expecting to see four receiver sets and some pony backfields add some new wrinkles. Um, both of those things were at least in the game plan and attempted, especially the four receiver sets. Uh, I, I, before we get into the coordinators, I want to hop back for a second and kind of look at the injury report because there are some obviously notable names still on the injury report for Thursday. Uh, not practicing. These are the key names to focus on. Uh, for will be a big day for uh, the final injury report. Marquise Pouncey with an ankle, Joe Hayden with a shoulder, and Roosevelt Nix with a knee injury. Neither have practiced so far uh, all week. So uh, they're obviously they're veteran guys, but you know their status is very much up in the air as of this recording. Yeah, and not that it means much. Keith Butler seems to think or, or seems optimistic that Joe Hayden will be able to go. Uh, Joe, uh, you know, supposedly told him uh, he thinks he'll be ready to go, but they all think they're going to be ready to go. So uh, we'll have to see what happens there. Uh, Knicks, I mean, we've kind of, you know, based on what Tomlin said on Tuesday about Knicks, it doesn't sound promising when it comes to him. Right. And I guess the big question now is Marquise Pouncey and – if he does not play, obviously B.J. Finney would be the next guy up. Uh, could we see uh, Patrick Morris get promoted on Saturday? Uh, yeah, maybe if Pouncey is going to miss. I mean, I don't know who your backup center would be otherwise. So that's possible. Absolutely. And 
if indeed that is the case, who goes out the door to make room for him? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I haven't even gotten to that part because uh, I was still hopeful and optimistic that Pouncey would be able to play. But uh, probably Elliot be the yo-yo, as you talked about on Wednesday. So yeah, uh, that might be indeed the best case scenario when it comes to there, and we'll see. We'll learn. I, you know, I'm not turning in my uh, projected inactive list <laughs> early this week. Yeah. <laughs> Less, lesson learned uh, last week there, but that you know that will be, I think, the the key sign. I, I, one would think Pouncey might end the week today is questionable. Mm -hmm. uh, and if he does, then I think Saturday would be a good gauge as to whether or not Pouncey will try to give it a go. If they make the move with Patrick right. Morris, then that's obviously a sign that Pouncey will be down. Uh, if they don't, then it'll be a, probably a sign that Pouncey will be up. So there's another reason to pay attention to studentsdepot.com on Saturday while you're watching college football. And to look at cornerback, you know, we talk about what happens if Finney steps up for Pouncey. You know, Finney, Finney should play reasonably well, even if he's not going to be at Pouncey's level. If Hayden doesn't go, guess who enters the fold? Everybody's fan favorite, Artie Burns. And yeah, we'll see yeah. if he's uh, if he's got the confidence back. I, I liked – it was a really minor thing. I know it's a 33-3 loss. I was trying to find any sort of optimism. I liked his body language in that Patriots game. I thought he, he and Dangerfield did a heck of a job on special teams, but I just thought – Overall, I kind of saw some energy, some excitement, even late in that game when the, you know, when the game was over and energy was kind of down. The body language across the board I thought was pretty poor for both sides of the football. But Artie Burns, I thought, kind of looked like he had some confidence back. And does that mean good play? Obviously, not necessarily. Uh, but uh, that is one small positive thing, and we'll get our answer if he has to start on Sunday. Absolutely. And if you think, uh, you know, if you're depressed a little bit now uh, after listening to the Steelers injury report, uh, you might have a little optimism back when you look at what's going on with the Seattle Seahawks right now. Uh, not practicing for them on Thursday were Joey Hunt, who's really a backup uh, backup center. Puna Ford's obviously the big name uh, with that calf uh, starter there. You know, earlier in the week, Pete Carroll didn't sound too optimistic about him. Uh, Tedrick, and remember, this is a team already without, uh, uh, what's his name, Jalen Reed, uh, due, uh, due to the suspension there. Jerron uh, Reed, yeah. Uh, Jerron Reed up front there, so, you know, obviously he's going to miss. It'd be another big loss if Puna Ford uh, is not able to play Sunday against the Steelers. Uh, safety, Tedrick. Thompson with a hamstring. Now, Tedrick Thompson uh, appears to really be in the doghouse on top of that due to him giving up some big plays against the Cincinnati Bengals. Uh, him not practicing on Thursday is not a great sign. They, Regardless, if even if Tedrick Thompson plays, they might have a little bit of a change on the back end uh, back there uh, with him regardless. And another big, you know, uh, you, you talk about Rosie Nix, the Steelers special teams captain, being – you know, down this week. Well, the Seahawks look like they're going to be without their special teams captain and best special teams player as well, too, and Nico Thorpe, who's dealing with a, a, a hamstring right now. Uh, limited in Thursday practice for the Seahawks were wide receiver David Moore. but they, they, they're going to need that guy sooner rather than that rather than later uh, with a shoulder. It'll be interesting if he goes. Uh, uh, Tyler Lockett, limited after being uh, sitting out on Wednesday, so you know he's not a hundred percent right now. And they added Quentin Jefferson, another uh, uh, defensive lineman, defensive end, uh, to their injury report as being limited on Thursday. And Quentin Jefferson had two sacks against the game against the Bengals, so that's going to be uh, an interesting one to watch on Saturday with them to see if they make any kind of a move. Look, it already looks like you're going to have Poodle Ford maybe down, uh, you know. Let, let's see if they have to make a move, you know, uh, to bring someone up, but maybe a defensive lineman from their practice squad uh, on, on Saturday as well. Uh, practicing fully for them, and all these guys sound like they'll be available if needed uh, for uh, for Sunday tackle Dwayne Brown, George Fant tackle uh, Will Dis. Uh, Disley, who banged his knee in that game, uh, uh, and I think he banged it with Justin Britt, who's also on the list as, as practicing fully. Guard Mike Upati, who uh, might start in this game uh, if he's healthy enough to do so. Uh, defensive end LJ Collier, the rookie out of, uh, where, was he, where was he, TCU? Mm -hmm. uh, he was inactive last week. It'd be interesting to see if they get him up and going this week as a backup. And defensive end Ziggy Ansa, who sat out the game against the Bengals, uh, might be close as well with the shoulder. Safety Ugo Amadi, uh, who 
Carroll didn't sound too optimistic about to start the week. Uh, practice fully on Thursday. It'd be interesting to see if he goes. And, of course, J- J- uh, Jadavion Clowney. Uh, should play, not injury-related. was back practicing full uh, on, on Thursday as well, too. So that's a banged-up bunch over there as well. It is. The one good thing with Seattle, like most 4-3 teams, and we'll talk about this a little bit later when we kind of preview uh, what Seattle's going to offer. They have a deep defensive line. They have seven, eight guys deep, and, and, and as long as maybe a Quinn Jefferson does play, you know, losing Puno forward would certainly be a pretty big blow. Uh, there is a good enough rotation where they have experienced guys to come off the bench and, and try to fill in there. But, yeah. Uh, both teams certainly get some bumps and bruises to, to start this year. Uh, oh, sorry, I, I, I kind of left you hanging there. I was trying to think about where I didn't have anything else you wanted to add with the injury report. But, but one topic I want to go to – actually, we'll, let's go to the coordinators first. Then we'll go to part of the topic everyone's waiting for us to touch base on. But you mentioned earlier Dave, Randy Feetner, uh talking about Pony, coordinators talking yesterday, Keith Beller and Randy Feetner. But let's stick with the Randy Feetner uh, right now. What else from, from him did you did you take note of? Uh, let's see, you know, just, I, I, you know, him, him being kind of spooked early stuck out to me, uh, Mm -hmm. when, when, uh, you know, when it came to the running game, uh, as far as that goes, uh, I'm trying to think what else he had, uh, that, that comes to mind. And, you know, you talk about Dante Moncrief's struggles and how, you know, sometimes, you know, your your best free throw player, uh, you know, just can't sink a free throw all of a sudden. You know, that that kind of thing. Uh, how much is that finger an issue with Dante Moncrief? I mean, we don't really know for sure. I mean, but uh, uh, it's clearly bothering. It's clearly in yeah, some part of the issue. Right, and he did not really deny that when he talked earlier in the week there. So you know, you, hopefully, hopefully you can get him. Uh, back going in this game, and you know, I, really, I think that's that's the most that uh, you know. He did talk a little bit about uh, uh, Vance McDonald, and you hit on this in, in 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 a video post I think yesterday there about look when they were in man they were paying Vance McDonald a lot of in, uh, attention there, and, and Randy said as much during his uh, talk coordinator uh, Thursday. And when they were zo- in, in zone, you know, they, that's when they would try to, you know, look at him maybe to get him the ball. But uh, the Patriots did it. You know, we talked well, you know, three months ago about how Bill Belichick tries to take your, your top two players away from you. And they were able to do that uh, uh, Sunday with, with Juju and Vance McDonald pretty much merely by just running a lot of man. And mm-hmm. they didn't use as much, I don't think, kind of sub-package. You know, allowed them to kind of stay kind of big uh, defensively and focus a little bit more on the run. And, you know, in doing so, that helped kind of shut down that running game. As you said at the top of the show, the Steelers' offensive line wasn't great, especially at the point of attack uh, when it came to uh, to runs. And there was probably a run or two that Ben probably should have checked out of as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, I know Rant Feetner said, you know, we were going to get uh, fans the ball when they were in zone. Problem was, Patriots barely played any zone coverage. It was man across the board. And Patrick Chung, number 23, their longtime strong safety, just really locked up and locked down fans and played bump. And just kind of a similar approach as Gilmore took to Juju, being physical, playing press, playing man coverage, and just blanketing him. So I went back and looked at all those passes. And, you know, I think that there's still some criticism for Feetner for maybe not scheming McDonald more open and, and getting him the ball by design. But you know the routes that were called, the guy was just never open. So I understand better now why Vance wasn't involved. But I don't think that makes Feetner immune to criticism. He should have done a better job of trying to get McDonald open. Yeah, and you know how how much would the game? You know, let me let's not beat the dead horse. I mean, how how much would the would the uh, game have changed had they converted some of those short yardage situations? Had Moncrief caught that ball in the end zone? You know, yada, yada, yada. And then, obviously, mm-hmm. the defense giving up those big plays and things. I mean, it, you, you're just not going to beat them making those kind of uh, 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 cumulative-type tiny mistakes, if you will, and some obviously bigger than others. Yep. Uh, okay, that was basically it from him with Keith Butler. Uh, a lot of, what was it, dad gums from Keith Butler in this one, uh, which is probably a fair response when you when you give up 33 to the Pats. Yeah, and I know a lot of people, the way sometimes these, these comments come out and then initially on Twitter, you know, they can be, with not, with not knowing the context, they can make a guy uh, look back. Make no mistake about it, the Steelers' defense was, you know, they, they were awful. You know, they uh, Brady and them run, running those rub routes. I, I kind of took Butler's comments, or, or I did take Butler's comments about 
uh, the picks and, you know, he was asked really about Russell Wilson and, uh, you know, Russell Wilson isn't really the kind of quarterback that, that gets rid of the football or is more of one that will hold on to the football longer than a guy such as Tom Brady. And that's kind of how the, the, the question was framed. He went into it as in, well, Tom Brady don't have to hold on to the football because those dadgum, uh, all those pick routes that they run. Mm-hmm. But, you know, he did say, look, you know, some some were legal, some were illegal uh, kind of things. But, you know, that's that's part of football, you know, and, and, and it is. I mean, you had to go into that game knowing if you played a lot of man coverage early, that's the kind of stuff that you were going to see. And, right. and, and they just did not have a good answer for it. And uh, until you do and until you get, uh, I think Mike Tomlin, going back to what he said earlier in the week, you know, you got to put Tom Brady in those competitive situations. And they just failed to do that. The Patriots stayed on uh, on uh, you know, on course, uh, on target, uh, you know, ahead of the chains for a lot of the game there. And then, you know, when you finally did get away from, from, from man-heavy kind of stuff and went zone, you know, you had your miscommunications and your blown coverages. So, you know, they put only put Tom Brady on the ground once, and really that was a coverage sack that I'm surprised Brady took, to be quite honest with you, uh, deep down there in the red zone. If there's one bright spot about, uh, and I, I don't know if there's anything else you kind of want to talk, you know, he talked on com- about communication and the helmet the old and, and getting the signals in and, you know, same old stuff, you know, uh, uh, copy and paste that, that, you know, he's normally having to talk about, unfortunately, every start of the season there. Uh, you know, the, 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 I, I think the biggest thing when it when it comes to the game plan uh, this week was obviously the miscommunications and the inability to have an answer for those rubs and those picks. Yeah, I think he said it well. Um, that was the issue. And even Devin Bush, you know, he, the only thing I would add to about what Keith Butler said is, you know, Devin Bush uh, had a pretty good game in, in Butler's eyes. Said he had me kind of one minor mistake, which was getting picked on that, I think, 17-yard reception to Rex Burkhead early in that game. Um, was that on a – no, that was the first and 10, I believe. Yeah, but, uh, no, 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 it was uh, it, it was, was a first second. And it was a second and 10. Okay. Yeah, okay. and and people are wondering. Well, they're saying, well, Keith's wrong. Uh, Bush sh- uh, should have stayed. I mean, should have came up on that. Well, no, not necessarily. Because if he goes over, if he goes over to pick, you're you, what you're betting there in that situation. Yes, you're going to give up the reception, but B, you're 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 uh, you're betting that Bush will tackle that for a two or three yard gain, and then thus you set up the third and seven competitive situation there. Uh, mm-hmm. By by coming down low and trying to get your hands on them uh, and, and that kind of thing, and then getting yourself picked, and you know I guess technically that's a legal pick, right? I mean one within one mm-hmm. yard of, of, of the yep. line of scrimmage. I mean I don't like the I I don't like the kind of the body language on that by Izzo on that and. You know, Izzo was flagged one play later for 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 setting an illegal pick. But uh, uh, you know, you have to. You sometimes you you're going to give up the catch, but uh, in those situations. But you know, you have to make sure that you get yourself in a position where you can give yourself the best opportunity to get the guy on the ground. And by going trying to go under like that and get himself picked, obviously he had no chance. If he would have went over and stayed at his proper depth, then you're betting that 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 Devin Bush makes the tackle for a three yard gain there. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I'm sure Butler is is accurate when he says he played that wrong. The only thing, only thing I didn't understand is he was saying that Bush and Kelly played on the same level, which isn't true. Uh, he didn't get picked by Kelly; he got picked by the tight end. But point taken, he probably should have worked over top of that instead of coming under. Right, and look, I mean the communication thing. I mean, I I don't have an answer for it. I mean, you just got to get better at it. Mm-hmm. Will we see? I mean, you think uh, T.J. Watt going to wear the green dot again? It almost seems like that's coming at least another week, doesn't it? Yeah, it does sound like another week. Though I hope Bush's role expands into some time work too. I thought week one is where you have uh, the slightest hint of training wheels on for him, and not having him in that every down role. Week two, though, I'm I'm taking the training wheels off fully. Yeah, look, I mean, that's why you drafted him, right? You got to mm-hmm. get him up and running as soon as possible. And you know, I, look, he's a smart kid. He, uh, you know, he had all those kind of duties at, at at Michigan and all. And now it's just a, a, a uh, and you know, he's gonna make mistakes. And you're gonna have to accept that once he gets that dot 
you know, that, that green dot on him. But you're going to have to just kind of work through those things. And the sooner that – and look, you know, what to uh, – uh, you know, I know it's it, – it, how, how big of a deal is it? I mean, I think it's, it's – especially when Watt's not used to doing it. He said he did it a little bit in that third preseason game against the Titans. But, I mean, he obviously didn't play a lot. He's not used to, to doing it. It's kind of hard to communicate with your defensive backs anyway. He talked about sometimes about being – you know, exerting a lot of injury, uh, uh, energy during during play. You know, it's one more thing for him have to to have to do that you really don't want him to have to do, right? Yeah, I mean, it might not be ideal. Uh, I think the only concern would be, I imagine this is pretty new to him. I mean, he did it like like you said against Tennessee. Has he ever done it in his football career before in college or anything? I he mean, seemed I, to say I, no. You right, know, that's right. that's. I mean, he wasn't particularly asked, but but I, I think kind of the line of questioning questioning in his answers. And I listened to the complete interview on that. It made it it made it sound like it, it's new to him. You know? Right. So, I, I I mean, I guess either way you're putting in Devin Bush or you're putting in T.J. Watt or even a Mark Barron, it's someone new in Pittsburgh system or new to the NFL. So you're going to have a newness issue no matter who you choose. I mean, I, I'm generally fine with it. I was more concerned with when Watt came off the field, they were busting coverages and allowing two touchdowns. Uh, that's a pretty clear correlation, which is concerning. And Watt had no – really had <laughs> didn't have a clue whether or not who, if anybody, and it didn't mm-hmm. – I don't know. I, I've looked at the – you know, as close as you can on the TV tape to see if anybody else had a green dot, and I didn't see uh, when, when Watt was out of the game there. And, you know, a couple of those busts later on, as you pointed out right away, happened when Watt wasn't on the field. Was that the reason? Was that the sole reason? I Who knows, you know? Mm-hmm. Uh, but, you know – uh, look, uh, uh, and look, but Butler says we got, you know, the, the, we got to do better coaching, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, I mean, OK, we get it. And, and I appreciate him, appreciate him taking that. But here's the thing we talked about, you know, uh, throughout the kind of uh, off season in, in the training camp there. <laughs> you, you keep having these these same kind of issues and keep Butler's not going to have to worry about having coordinated. <laughs> Uh, coordinator Thursday or having to worry about uh, the Patriots and rub routes, you know? Yeah, there'll be no uh, miscommunication on the golf course he'll end up on. Right, right. Uh, the last thing I wanted to know with Butler, then move on from that. It's not something I, I don't know if it was even asked. I don't believe it was in, in his interview, but I had the post yesterday on it. It's just how this team defends empty and the continued problems in empty. And I understand you want to disguise coverages and not tip your hand. And, and, and when teams go empty, it's it's hard to avoid that. But, man, Dave, I mean, that third quarter, I mean, you got cornerbacks on fullbacks. You got Joe Hagan on James Devlin, Steven Nelson on Rex Burkhead, and you're both inside linebackers or two linebackers on receivers. Vince Williams on Josh Gordon, Devin Bush on Julian Edelman, Vince Williams on Julian Edelman. I mean, in that scenario, you just got to man up, and, and maybe you're tipping your coverage some, but it's better to tip your coverage and put your best people and put corners on, on receivers instead of putting them on fullbacks and trying to be cute and disguise stuff. So – this team continues to have no answers versus empty. This is not new. This happened last year. The Patriots are running the same place. The Chiefs ran last year to create big plays. I mean, it's a habitual issue. And if you have any offensive coordinator that has any sort of you know tape study and any sort of offensive mind and can spread things out, uh, you're going to pick this team apart versus empty. There's just no answers, and that's a huge, huge concern that it's just not going away. Speaking of empty, on the other side of the football with the Steers, when they had the four and five wide receivers on the field, they still couldn't move the football. I think it was something like 13. I think it was like uh, with with five wide receivers on the field, something like 13 dropbacks. Uh, I think they averaged, what did I put on put on the interwebs uh, early in the week? 2.38 or something yards per play uh, mm. on those 13 13. Uh, 13 dropbacks out with five wide receivers on the field. Five of those, I don't know, what was it? Nine completions, I think, went to Ryan Switzer for, <laughs> mm. for, for uh, I think, how, how tall are you, Alex? Mm-hmm. About as tall as Ryan Switzer. Uh, about, as, ab- ab- about as about as tall as the yardage uh, per <laughs> reception that Ryan Switzer uh, had on, on his reception. So, you know, obviously not good there. Couldn't get the ball to Vance McDonald. You think people are tired of us talking about the Patriots now? I'm a little tired of it at this point. So let's move on to a little bit of speculations, probably the quote-unquote news of the day. I know my timeline's been blown up about it. I'm sure yours is as well. Uh, Dolphins have – they're not actively shopping, but they are uh, – 
what is even the, the phrasing here? Allowing Minka Fitzpatrick to seek a trade or at least have trade offers be you know sent into Miami for them to consider. And every fan base, basically, Steelers included, are asking, you know, is that guy an option in Pittsburgh? So let me give you, your, let me let me get your quick answer of, you know, is there any shot of this team making a play for Minka Fitzpatrick? Uh, a, the, 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 the answer to that question would be, I don't know what percentage, but I would say yes. Uh, it's probably low. Uh, B, I think it is something that you do look into. Uh, you know, Jim Nagy, a guy that, that you and I both respect from, you know, uh, work at the senior bowl and all like that. It might, you know, my biggest question with, 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 with Fitzpatrick was how is he kind of character wise and, you know, off the field and, and captainship, you know, qualities and all like that. And, you know, N- Nagy kind of out of the blue posted all these check marks, you know, all these boxes that, that Minka uh, Fitzpatrick checks and, you know, I, I think that carries a little bit of weight, at least with me, to to get a guy's opinion on him like that. Uh, I think uh, Fitzpatrick checks damn near pretty much all the boxes when it comes to uh, Colbert. And wasn't that that was that was two two drafts ago? That was the one where you know, Steelers had everybody and their brother at that Alabama pro day. Of course, now you did have the linebacker and all uh, out of out of Alabama as well too. I don't think you can read too much. Uh, overly into that. I mean, it's a, it's a prime program. You know, you're going to have a lot of people there, but I do remember the Steelers, you know, uh, uh, sending the house, if you will. Uh, he is still on a uh, uh, rookie contract. That makes him attractive. Obviously, being a first-round pick, that comes with a fifth-year option uh, additionally. Uh, if you're looking at it, he, he is a position-versatile player, uh, and I think if you're looking, if you're the Steelers and you like his upside as a free safety, then, you know, even, even more the reason maybe to look into him. Now, what, what is the cost? I mean, as you just kind of pointed out, there are a lot of teams are probably going to have interest, going to be inquiring about him. Mm-hmm. Kevin Colbert is, is, you know, he values those like it or not, uh, he values those first round selections. So to think I, I think it's I think it's pretty much a stretch to think that Kevin Colbert would be willing to part with any kind of package that would involve a first round draft pick for Minka Fitz, Fitzpatrick. So then you back up from there and say what kind of uh, package would it take uh and, and you know that 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 you know would be the best one that the Dolphins could get for Minka Fitzpatrick. My I, you know, I, I've kind of given a little bit of thought to this. Maybe a second-round pick, maybe a guy like Chukwuma Okorafor, and maybe I don't know, maybe a, one of those fifth-round picks or something. You know, didn't they just get one for uh, for, uh, uh, for Dobbs? Dobbs? You know, there. To me, that would that would be the scenario that I could see Kevin Colbert offering. Uh, whether or not that'd be good enough to get him is 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 anybody's guess. Yeah, core four is interesting because you know obviously they trade away Tunsil and you have an up and comer. Hopefully, I mean, he struggled in a core four. Um, and I yeah. and, I, and I only say that because he was down this past week and right. uh, you know. Uh, you know, they seem to be a little bit, you know, they seem to be a little bit more impressed with Banner. And then, of course, you could go into next year's draft and get you another tackle, you know, second or third round or whatever uh, in there. So, well, you might want to have a second round pick at that point. Right. If I you're mean, trading it. Right. I mean, if you if you give up a second, you wouldn't have that. I mean, then then I uh, but let me look. We we've seen under Colbert, this team go into a draft without a second or at least trade away their second, right? In like 2000 and I don't know, 10, was it when they, uh, had a deal and ended up with two third round picks and didn't have a second that year or well, something, something like that. But regardless, the, I, I can't see Colbert deal in the first four. So then back up from there, what kind of package could you put together that Colbert would put together? Mm-hmm. That would be realistic. That would land Minka Fitzpatrick. I mean, obviously, he's a good player. He'd be helpful. I'm not opposed to it. If they do it, awesome. I want to see this team be aggressive and make the moves they have to to try to upgrade the defense. You're not going to get an argument from me about that. But realistically, you know, you talk about, you know, they've gone in the draft without a second-round pick before. Sure, 
but they haven't gone in the drafts without really any second day picks before. They've already traded the third round pick for 2020 to Denver in the Devin Bush deal. Uh, they'd be trading a second round pick here at least to get Fitzpatrick. That leaves them with hoping and assuming they can get a compensatory pick for Le'Veon Bell, a late third round pick going in with just one day two pick. And I circle back to what Colbert said this past year and in, 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 in the move to trade up for Devin Bush. And uh, I know this may not apply to every year, but it sure seemed to uh, imply that it does apply to every single year. Colbert said, quote, we said under no circumstances we would go into tomorrow with less than two picks. That was our criteria with, with, uh, when myself and coach and Art Rooney sat down. Uh, sure, we're looking to trade up, but we want to have two picks tomorrow because there's still good players left. So assuming they don't hate the depth of the 2020 draft, and obviously things are still early trying to evaluate that, but they probably have some sort of idea. Um, it's hard to see them banking on one, getting that compensatory pick, which is probable but not guaranteed, and then just having one day two pick for next year's draft. And then on top of it, assuming you did even make that trade, how quickly could Fitzpatrick help you this year? I mean, obviously, Sean Davis, I mean, you're not going to – I don't think you would trade for him and throw him right out in there. Uh, so, I mean, is this a late season guy or is this, would this be more of a 2020, well, we were going to need to draft a free safety mm -hmm. anyway, you know, type. And once again, you know, I, 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 admire, you know, I like his position flexibility. I think that's attractive to the students, but, you know, someone tweeted me, well, uh, tweeted me as if, uh, well, they're going to need a, 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 a early round cornerback anyway. I don't think the Steelers, if inquiring about him, would be doing so with the sole intention of him being a corner. I think it would be more with the sole intention of him being the guy that would take over at free safety. I agree, and that's a fair point to make. Um, and, and Fitzpatrick's under contract through what twenty twenty one? Uh, well, it's a the four year rookie deal. Let's see, he's in the second, so you'd have two more years, and then the fifth round, uh, fifth uh, fifth year option. Okay. So he's already. This is year number two, right? Okay. So he would have two more years of his rookie deal left, two thousand twenty and two thousand twenty one, and then obviously. You would have to decide fairly quick, you know, about it, about his fifth year option mm -hmm. uh, as well, too. So technically, you could have him for three years, the next three seasons, plus whatever is left in this season uh, mm -hmm. uh, by inquiring. But, I mean, he is he's a baby still, right? He's like 22. Uh, I mean, he hasn't played a lot. I don't think he had the best of game against uh, the Ravens. No, I think Hollywood got him uh, against the Ravens this past week there, but. You know, uh, so I guess the short answer we should be giving to folks is, I mean, I can see the Steelers acquire, uh, inquiring about him. I just don't know if they would have the package to be able to go get him or willing to uh, 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 put together the package that might yeah. be enough to go get him. Yeah, I, I think it's just too far. I think they've made their aggressive move. I'm not saying that you should be happy about that or that should be, uh, you know, you know, just shrugged off. But I just can't I can't see them making that aggressive move, having all that uncertainty in, in day two, even, even understanding that, yeah, you know, Fitzpatrick could be the free safety, assuming Sean Davis leaves. I know there are, aren't there some concerns about Fitzpatrick with his tackling, his open field tackling, and the Steelers love safeties that can tackle and be effective and physical. Yeah, I don't remember, Alex. I, I got to be honest. I, I don't remember back to my evaluation on him. Okay. Uh, when, 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 so I, you know, I'm, I'm going, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to punt on that one. All right, fair enough. But again, a lot of teams should be interested. The Dolphins aren't actively shopping him. They'll have to be blown away by a deal. Obviously, they know the value of keeping him, too, even if he's not exactly happy. But it is something that, you know, was worth addressing. Um, I think we, it's fair to say that it's a player that's interesting enough and at that baseline level fits enough to at least worth, you know, devoting 10 minutes to on the podcast. Yeah, and look, I mean, if you did, obviously, I think the guy that, you know, if, if you did and you needed a roster spot, then Cam Kelly would be the guy that that would go off and then maybe on to the practice squad or something like that. Uh, I'd probably keep Cam Kelly. I think you want to have the depth. It would probably go come from some other position. I'm not sure who or where. Uh, Elliot, again, could be your yo-yo. Uh, I don't know if I'm bumping Cam. I, I think Cam Kelly struggled, but I don't know if I want to bump him off the roster altogether. But you couldn't make room for him. 
Yeah, oh, that wouldn't. I mean, that would be the, the most minor. You'd, you'd find a place. If you're getting a guy like Minka Fitzpatrick, you're finding someone to cut. That's not going to be uh, a hassle. All right, Dave, uh, I want to talk about Seattle and, and our preview of, the, of their offense and defense. Are, are, you we, on, are you on to Seattle? We're uh, on to <laughs> Seattle, yeah. We're leaving Miami. The Patriots are on the Miami. We're on the Seattle. Uh, and, but before we do that and we go into our breakdown, uh, let's talk to our buddy, for the first time, actually, we appreciate him coming on. Brady Henderson, Seattle Seahawks reporter for ESPN's NFL Nation, giving his breakdown and evaluation of the Seattle Seahawks. Okay, welcome back to the podcast. And it is Wednesday. Well, it is Wednesday. You're actually hearing this on a Friday because of uh, scheduling times and all like that. Uh, we had to get our uh, our guest this week to talk about the Steelers' opponent uh, done on Wednesday. And, of course, like I said, you'll be hearing this uh, as part of the Friday podcast. We're pleased to be joined by Brady Henderson, who covers the Seattle Seahawks He uh, for ESPN.com. He's one of their NFL Nation reporters. This is his first time. Uh, on the uh, terrible podcast, Brady, uh, and, and also you can follow Brady on Twitter at Brady Henderson, and of course you should be reading his work this week on ESPN.com as well. Brady, welcome to the terrible podcast. Well, thank you for having me, uh, Brady. First of all, let's uh, let's start kind of a, with with a view of you know from thirty thousand feet of the uh, uh, of the week one game that the you know the the Seahawks had twenty one twenty home victory over the Cincinnati Bengals. Uh, what were kind of what what are your kind of overarching thoughts coming out of that contest? Well, the you know the the really the thirty thousand foot view is that you know this was a game that was kind of typical of a lot of games that they play uh, or that they have played under Pete Carroll for whatever reason. Um, you know they tend to start slow and then just kind of pull things out at the very end. So um, there's a lot of people you know who are kind of you know concerned about the secondary, which really got torched. Uh, by Andy Dalton, who threw for a career high four hundred and eighteen yards. Um, part of that was, you know, some scheme stuff where they, you know, they felt like they wanted to, um, you know, really take away the run and, and force, you know, some underneath throws. So they stayed in, in their base defense quite a bit, uh, even against some, uh, you know, what would be nickel situations. Um, so the pass defense was shaky. Uh, the run game really could not get a whole lot going. Uh, the pass rush was probably the, the best part about the whole day for them. Um, and really started to see the early benefit of that Jadeveon Clowney trade. So, um, but but the bigger picture view is that it was sort of just a, a, a Seahawks game, the type of game that you see from them a lot, where they struggle out of the gates and then pull it together at the very end. Yeah, and they did. It felt like with uh, with uh, Andy Dalton, you know, throwing for so much. John Ross, of course, uh, finally had a breakout game for him. Uh, it, it felt like uh, watching the TV version. I've only watched a little bit of the All 22 of that. Uh, John Ross left a couple plays on the field at that, but uh, it, it it felt like, and of course, two of the touchdowns to John Ross, one uh, on that kind of uh, flea flicker wheel, if you will, and then the other one. When uh, Tedrick Thompson just missed time to jump, uh, it, it seemed more than anything. Kind of, Bengals kind of got fortunate uh, as far as that concerned. Were you were you surprised that the Bengals came out really throwing? And and, and I mean, look, the, you're you're right. The uh, the Seahawks front, even without Reed and all, did I thought did a great job from a pressure and obviously shutting down you know the uh, the run. So you know, were you a bit surprised that that the Bengals came out throwing the way that they did? Well, no, and I don't think they were either, just because that's that was sort of what they wanted them to do. Um, you know, they talked a lot in the week leading up to that game just about how uh, it was really a lot of unknowns with that that Bengals uh, offense, really the, the team, you know, as a whole under a first-year head coach, but especially on offense because it's a first-year coach who also calls the offensive plays. Obviously, they kept things, you know, vanilla in the preseason like most teams do, so they really did not have a great feel for for what that offense would look like and. Um, you know, I think that part of the, the, the idea behind staying in base a lot is maybe just to, to force them into to more predictable, um, you know, plays, uh, just to try to dictate some of that. But, um, you know, even with the, all the element of surprise that there was, they then added a flea flicker on top of that, and they got them on one of those plays uh, for one of those touchdowns. And then the other one, as you mentioned, was just a, a pretty bad misplay by Tedrick Thompson. And, um, you know, Pete Carroll on his Monday morning radio show seemed to – to maybe hint that a, a change could be coming uh, in that at that position that's going to be backed on later in the day and, and really didn't want to discuss that possibility. But um, it would not be surprising if they have a new player starting at safety uh, alongside Bradley McDougal. Um, they're, they're still pretty high on Tedrick Thompson, who was uh, quite the player at, at Colorado. He was among the league leaders, among the leaders in the country 
in final season there in terms of interceptions and pass breakups. So the, the MO on him was that he was this big ball hawk coming out of college. Uh, but they, Pete Carroll probably has the lowest tolerance of any head coach for a defensive back getting beat over the top like that. So um, if there's a change in the secondary, it could be there. They also have an injury situation uh, with their rookie fourth-round pick, Ugo Amadi, who was playing nickel uh, for them in that game. He hurt his shoulder. So it could actually be two changes uh, in that secondary on Sunday in Pittsburgh. Yeah, we both, uh, Alex and I both scouted and really liked Ugo. You know, I think it was uh, out, of, out of Oregon there, you know, playmaker, a little bit undersized, but a playmaker at that. Uh, mentioned, you know, you mentioned the injuries there. I know Puna Ford got a little bit bang, banged up in that game. Uh, Ziggy Ansa uh, sat that one out. Uh, obviously, uh, I think there were a few other guys banged up as well in that game. What, what's, the, uh, what's the early word uh, on, on the injury report there? Yeah, so we, we've not heard from Pete Carroll yet today, so we'll have a better idea of, uh, you know, what's going on there. But, um, you know, I think it, from from my read on it, just the fact that, you know, they did sign uh, veteran cornerback Jamar Taylor, who had competed with Ugo Amadi at that nickel spot. Um, so that does kind of tell you that maybe the, the injury to Amadi, you know, is going to keep him out um, for at least a week. We don't know that, but that's just kind of my read based on the moves that they made. Uh, that was the only roster move they made, so that seems to bode well for uh, Will Disley, their tight end, uh, who, who uh, kind of banged his knee, uh, same knee he injured as a rookie last year. Uh, Nico Forbes was, uh, you know, one of their backup cornerbacks and a, a special teams captain for them. He hurt his hamstring. Uh, don't really know how serious that is. Uh, and then the other one was, as you mentioned, Puna Ford. Um, my sense on that is that might be a, just a one-week, two two-week thing. Um, not something that doesn't seem like it's something that's going to, you know, land him on uh, injured reserve. Uh, but again, we'll we'll have a better sense of that once we hear from Pete Carroll. Funny enough, both uh, teams might miss their special teams captain. Steelers have Rosie Nix uh, with a knee injury, and you guys have Nico Thorpe possibly missing. But I want to go to the offense, Brady, and just kind of the evolution of the offense. Because in this pass-happy NFL, the Seahawks seem to be countering that a bit. And this, this you know, Chris Carson might be one of the most underrated running backs in football, if that's fair to say. When did this offense kind of evolve into being, I don't want to say it's a run-heavy, but definitely it can be a run-focused uh, offense. And then how have they gotten Chris Carson involved in the pass game? I mean, they talked about that all offseason. They wanted to get their backs involved as receivers. They didn't do that last year. So they designed stuff as a check down. Just kind of what is the evolution of the Seahawks offense in the run game? Yeah, I mean, they've even we've even seen him split out wide. Or at least we saw that during the training camp. You would see him and Rashad Penny occasionally split out wide. So uh, they're they're doing it quite a bit. And uh, you know, I think he was he, like he led the team with seven targets um, in that game on Sunday. And he was uh, I want to say you know tied for like 55th or 58th uh, last year in terms of you know in terms of targets among running backs. Even though he was up there among the league leaders uh, in rushing yards. So he was you know he was a starting running back. Was hardly used in the passing game. Um, so, you know, Brian Schott and I ever talked about wanting to sort of double his, his involvement there in terms of the number of targets, and we uh, started to see that right away. Now, in terms of just the, the focus of the offense overall, I mean, they, they've really always been a, a run heavy team under Peak Carroll. And the only times that they've sort of gotten away from that was, you know, a couple seasons ago when they just could not run the ball um, and really sort of were forced into a lot of passing situations. Um, and so they kind of got away from that. I mean, it, it's definitely, um, you know, kind of they've put more on Russell Wilson's plate throughout his career, just as you see a lot of teams do, uh, as they sort to of break in young quarterbacks. Um, but, uh, you know, a couple of years ago was really the, the, the outlier in terms of how much they passed the ball just because they couldn't run the ball, which is really what they want to do. To look at the receivers and to go to Tyler Lockett, you know, Lockett is one of the best receivers in football, though he's a good one, but he's one of my favorite receivers. I've loved him ever since he came out of Kansas State, a really dynamic guy. He's the number one this year, and I think he talked about it last week being double teamed for the first time ever that Cincinnati did now that you know Doug Baldwin's retired and it's a young group uh, outside of him. How has Lockett handled being the number one receiver in this offense? Well, I mean, I think, yeah, I think the, the only real evidence we have was, was what we saw there, and uh you know, he, he may have, I think he may have been overstating uh, a little bit how much he got double teamed, it's just at least based on what Pete Carroll said on that that um, he did get double teamed, but it wasn't like it was on every play. And so mm-hmm. that makes it, you know, it, it's, you know, the receivers in his offense have always talked about um, really trying to be, you know, they those guys realize they're not going to be, you know, first or second or third. They're not going to be in the top 10 in catches or targets or receiving yards just because there's not enough volume uh, to go around in this type of offense. Uh, but they always talk about wanting to be, you know, the most efficient receivers, and really they were. A lot of the efficiency numbers last year 
um, in terms of, you know, catch rates and all that. Um, they were up there. And so that's, you know, you saw that on uh, on Sunday. Lockett didn't have a target, I believe, until, um, you know, that 44-yard touchdown pass on the first play of the fourth quarter. So um, those are the plays that those guys have to make, knowing that, you know, if you're only going to throw the ball what, 20 times like they did, uh, you got to take advantage of those big play opportunities when they come. Uh, you have DK Metcalf, Metcalf, the young rookie. Uh, he looked. Uh, I mean, I, look. Everybody knows the story with him. Real, real, you know, kind of a burner guy there, coming out of Ole Miss and all. And there was some questions about his route running. Uh, from the time he was drafted until through this first game, has your perception of him, you know, changed any? And then uh, piggybacking onto that question, it really seems like this team is looking for a number three wide receiver. Now, obviously, Carson looks like he's going to be involved more maybe in the passing game this year. But, you know, do they need somebody to step up and be that, that number three wide receiver? Well, I, they're going to have uh, David Moore back within, I think, the next couple of weeks. He, he sort of was their uh, number three guy last year. Uh, you know, behind Doug Baldwin and Tyler Lockett, uh, really emerged as uh, a pretty big play threat. Um, I think, you know, pro football focus had this down about, you know, uh, wide receivers when targeted on, on deep balls, and he had like the third or fourth best uh, passer rating when targeted on deep balls. I think Juju Smith-Schuster was one of the receivers in front of him. So once he's back, I think he will, you'll see him slide into that number three role. Um, and then in terms of DK Metcalf, I think that, you know, the one thing that is probably surprised me the most is, um, you know, there was all the talk coming out a little bit. I think you mentioned it too about uh, the route running. And, you know, I've talked to people in the NFL who think that that was probably the main reason why you know, a guy who was in a lot of the mock drafts and a lot of the pre-draft, pre-draft conversation was talked about, you know, maybe being one of the first uh, receivers taken, if not the first, and he fell all the way to the, the very last pick of the second round. Um, I think the, my, my read on that in, in terms of talking to people in the NFL was that teams kind of got scared of, of the route running. And so, um, I expected that to be, I guess, a bigger issue, but, you know, it, it seems now that we've seen him for, you know, an off season in the summer. Um, I think that that was a little overblown and it was probably more a product of the way that he was used at Ole Miss and for whatever reason, them, you know, wanting to keep him on the outside. Of course they had the other, uh, stud receiver there who, was, you know, was drafted early, I, I believe by the 49ers. Um, and they sort of used him a, a lot of the inside route. I think it was more just a product of how he was used uh, as opposed to just physical limitations um, as a route runner. Uh, the, I'm sure you watched the uh, the Sunday night game between the Steelers and the Patriots, and the you know, Patriots just you know those man beaters, those those crossing routes, those rubs against the Steelers man coverage. I mean, you know Brady just doing what Brady does, and then taking the shots you know down the field, and the Steelers helped him out with some blown coverages and all. But you know back to kind of the man beaters and the rubs and those 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 underneath crossers. It just doesn't seem like that's the Seahawks' mo. But with that, I mean, you would think that you see that stuff is is glaring on tape when it comes to the Steelers' defense. Are you expecting uh, some of that? Yeah, yeah, and, and that's a lot of what you saw uh, in that game on Sunday against, against the Bengals. You know, the Seahawks really, you know, they, under Pete Carroll, they have really always been a defense that um, is going to say hey, the last thing that we're going to do is, is give up the deal to people. I'm not that any defense is okay with that, but it's really – you know, their entire scheme is, is built around that. And, um, you know, that's why you saw them draft Earl Thomas when they did and why they paid him a bunch of money, uh, is that they, they are really going to, above all else, prioritize, you know, preventing that deep ball. And so they're going to concede a lot of those underneath those. So um, that's really what they did. It was part of the reason why Andy Dalton racked up as many yards as he did, because they were sort of giving up those uh, those underneath routes. So maybe it's maybe a slightly different defensive game plan against a team that, um, you know, they, they are much more familiar with than they were in Cincinnati. Uh, but I think that just in terms of, of the way that they want to go about their business on defense, you know, a lot of, a lot of times those routes are going to be open. Yeah, but I, uh, I, was, I was really more talking about kind of with, with the Seahawks on the offensive side of the ball, the way the Patriots drilled the Steelers defense uh, with kind of those underneath man beaters and all. With, with oh, those I cross. Got, yeah, no, I'm sorry. That, that's yeah, right. That, that's my mistake. Yeah, um, I mean, this really, the Seahawks on offense, they want to make their money by running the ball, handling the football, and setting up those deep play action, uh, you know, deep play action shots. And so, um, you know, I think that it, we're going to have to wait and see exactly what this offense looks like in terms of the short area passing game, uh, just because for so many years, that was, 
you know, Luke Doug Baldwin made a living, you know, is lining up in the slot. Uh, not that he was exclusively a slot player, but uh, really making a living on, on those underneath routes and uh, wanted to scramble throws you know, from Russell Wilson, developing that, you know, um, that chemistry with him in terms of, you know, keeping the play alive and everything. So it's less clear what that part of their passing game is going to look like without Doug Baldwin. And that's where I think, um, you know, that, that's where maybe the running backs come into play there. Is I think we're going to see a lot of them, uh, even if it's not, you know, lining them out wide, uh, but just, you know, a lot of screen passes. This, for whatever reason, uh, was really not much of a, a heavy screen offense last year. And, um, you know, when a team has uh, some limitations in pass protection, which you saw, uh, than have on Sunday against Cincinnati, then, then the, I think the screen game becomes all the more important. How well was Jadavian Clowney? Obviously, that's the big move you guys made right before the season started. He played 48 snaps in week one. How well did he get integrated into that defense? And is he going to be someone that's going to move around a lot? Or how how do you think Seattle's going to use him maybe differently than how Houston did? Well, you know, he's going to be more of just a, a pure defensive end as, as opposed to, you know, Houston, he was a 3 4 mm. actor who dropped into coverage a lot just because. You know, he was athletic enough to do that. And uh, he actually talked about, you know, the that being a, a selling point in Seattle is the opportunity to really put his hand in the, in the dirt and really be, you know, a defensive end who all he really does is, is go upfield and, and get after the quarterback. So, um, you know, they may sort of flip him around in terms of the size, um, but he's going to be he's going to be a defensive end for them. And, um, yeah, I mean, he played, you mentioned it, 48 snaps. Probably really more than they anticipated, just because you know that was such a long layoff that he had, mm-hmm. in terms of, you know missing all the off season, uh, the contract dispute. He really had like four or five practices uh, with the Seahawks before they turned him loose, and you know, he talked afterwards about how he said it was kind of spinning uh, in terms of assignments, just because um, you know it's a lot to pick up in a short amount of time. But even then, uh, he he made a, a pretty pretty big impact on that game. And then my last question for you, Brady, is, you know, that Seahawks offensive line has always been hammered by the national media as being one that didn't protect Russell Wilson well and, and really a below-average line. How does it look this year with Afedi and Fluker and Justin Britt? How would you evaluate the starting five? Well, yeah, they, they've really got four of their five starters from last year. The, the one exception being J.R. Sweezy, who uh, left for Arizona. Um, and they more or less, you know, swapped out uh, left guards, those two teams, because the Seahawks signed. Uh, Mike Agapati, he's been out uh, with calf and foot injuries. So uh, you saw Ethan Postick start there on Sunday. Uh, that's going to be, you know, one thing to monitor this week is who do they have because it sounds like uh, sounds like Agapati is going to have a chance to play. But, um, you know, they were surprised. Yeah, I, I know that, that you know, this has not been a great pass protecting team uh, historically. Mm-hmm. Um, Pete Carroll, uh, you know, on the timetable to roll it off into the last year uh, as well as they ran the ball uh, and as well and as good as they were in the Pass protection was not great. Now, I think you always have to with the Seahawks and with a lot of teams, but you know, especially a team like the Seahawks has a quarterback who likes to extend plays. You know, you've always got to look at those individually and say, okay, what role did the quarterback have in this in terms of um, you know not getting the ball out or in terms of uh, you know trying to extend the play and, and you know you end up taking a sack as opposed mm-hmm. to throwing it away. Uh, that's always going to be you know the dual-edged sword there uh, of Russell Wilson's ability to, to keep things alive. Uh, but really, you know, it, it's, as I looked at it more of those issues on Sunday seem to be just the pass protection not holding up the way it needed to. Uh, Quentin Jefferson looked like he had a good good, uh, good game there, and I, I'm assuming that you're expecting Puna Ford, like you said earlier, to maybe uh, be out. So I assume uh, Quentin Jefferson would slide in there next to Al Woods. Uh, early word on Ziggy Ansa? Yeah, yeah, we're going to have to wait and see on that one, but it, it, the, the impression I got just from hearing them talk about it was that um, they think he's got a pretty good chance. And, you know, it seemed like he had a, a pretty good chance last week. Um, but, you know, they, they just sort of said he wasn't quite ready. And, um, you know, he, he was he's really only been practicing for a couple weeks now. And so um sounds like he just kind of was, was a little sore. Um, and, you know, they're, they're really taking the, the long view there uh, with us. And they're saying, look, we need this guy to be healthy in December, even if it means, uh, you know, bringing him along slowly. So, um I think he's going to have a good chance to play. And then, you know, I, in terms of uh, Quentin Jefferson, uh, you know, I think, you know, he's a guy who can go inside and outside for them. So um, if Ansa doesn't play, and even if he does play, you know, he won't necessarily start. Clowney did not start that game. He played quite a bit, but didn't start for them in their base defense. So um, we could see Jefferson actually starting on the outside as opposed to, 
uh, playing inside, but he, he's a guy who can do both for them. Uh, Mike Tomlin talked, uh, had a lot of praise for Bobby Wagner, of course, and, and why wouldn't he? And, and, and K.J. Wright, uh, when he talked uh, during his press conference on Tuesday, uh, you know, how, how did you view the uh, the linebacker play against the Bengals? Yeah, that, that's really, you know, for as much as uh, as much attention as the pass rush has gotten, uh, rightfully so, just with some of the names they got there, they, you know, they talk all offseason about, you know, this is going to be the strength of their team. And, and really, it might be the best trio of starting linebackers in the NFL. Um, you know, Bobby Wagner, Michael Fenwick, K.J. Wright. And uh, I think that's another part of the reason why they stayed in, in their base defense so much in that game, just because they figure, look, you got Mike, is he going to take Michael Kendricks or K.J. Wright off the field, two guys who are really good in coverage? Um, so, I, you know, I think they felt, look, we're going to take our chances with these guys as opposed to bringing in, you know, a rookie, uh, Nickelback, and even Amani, who was, you know, a rookie. Um, so, yeah, th- those guys played pretty well. I think Kendricks was um, – he might have been in coverage on, on the flea flicker. Um, of course, it's you know, I'm not one to say who was at fault there because I don't know exactly what everybody's responsibility is, but um, it looked like he may have got fooled there. But, um, yeah, they, they feel really good about their linebackers. Uh, and, again, it might be, might be the best trio in the NFL. All right, Brady, uh, what's your early read on this? The Seahawks' last two trips to Heinz Field hadn't gone well at all. I think outscored something like 45 to nothing there. Uh, obviously a different team this week. History really doesn't mean anything. But uh, what's your early read uh, on this? Do you have a final score prediction for us? Oh, boy. So I usually – what I always do is I look at the Vegas line, and then I, I go from there just because those guys are a lot better at predicting games than I am. Uh, so I'm going to have to hold off on, on making a prediction, but I, I mean, I think this is, you know, if you, if, if you hadn't seen that game on Sunday night and you, you know, you hadn't seen the, the, the Steelers game on Sunday night and you just saw, uh, you know, their defense, the Seahawks defense get, you know, secondary kind of get worked over, uh, pretty good to the tune of over 400 yards. You would think that, okay, it's going to get harder this week with Ben Roethlisberger, Juju Smith-Schuster in Pittsburgh, um, but, you know, I, I don't really also don't really know what to make of, of uh, what the Steelers are just after seeing that game Sunday night. So uh, I'm, I'm going to hold off on a prediction. But, um, yeah, I think the Seahawks are going to have, have their hands full in their secondary. All right. Fair enough. Well, Brady, we appreciate uh, you being a first timer on uh, on the terrible podcast. We'll have a lot of people, as many listeners as we can, reach out to you, hopefully on on Twitter at Brady Henderson and not only follow you, but uh, thank you for uh, uh, your time on the show and all. And down the road, keep us in mind. We'd like to have you uh, back on again should these go down down the road when these two teams meet again. So once again, thanks for being on the Terrible Podcast with Dave and Alex. Thanks, Brady. Yeah, you bet. Thanks for having me, guys. Thank you. And again, our thanks to Brady Henderson. You can follow him on Twitter at Brady Henderson. Uh, again, on Twitter, I appreciate him coming on. Uh, hopefully we'll have him on at, at some point down the line. But good information there from him. Um, so, Dave, we talked about the Seahawks injury report earlier uh, in, in the show. Um, let's start with Seattle's offense. And, you know, I think Brady talked about the run focus it's been and how that's always been the goal. And now they're kind of able to get back to that more by having a better backfield, probably a better offensive line. So from my perspective, and I'll let you weigh in on it, you know, that, that run game is, of course, the number one thing you have to shut down and then be prepared for play action. You know, New England really burned Pittsburgh on that last week, and I think you're, you're going to see Seattle try to do the same this time around. I think if you're a fantasy owner and you own Chris Carson this year, you're going to – I like the prospects of that, right? Mm, really underrated back. No one ever talks about Chris Carson, but the guy rushed for over 1,100 yards last year. I mean, he had a really good season. Wasn't he that uh, – wasn't he the one last year that did that amazing kind of flip? Uh, Was it? Uh, up and over, landing on his feet or whatnot. But uh, regardless, it looks like they're 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 more intent and and how could they not with kind of that offensive line of, of of using him a little bit more in 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 say the screen game or whatnot, kind of those flare outs, uh, if you will. They even lined them up out wide, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and ran it uh, kind of an end around with him too last and week. And ran an end around him, so they're not afraid to move him around and use him kind of as a uh, as a manipulated piece. I don't, I don't, I can't remember looking at it. I didn't look at his pass protection, uh, uh, but I, you know, they're probably not going to want to get him in too many instances when 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 that's concerned either. I, I think this is an offense that kind of wants to focus on. Being ball control, you know, using the running game, using Carson in in, in various ways in the passing game, if, if, if the opportunity presents itself, uh, I think he can run inside. I think he can run outside uh, there. So you know, obviously, I think the focus and Keith Butler did hit on this yesterday when he talked uh, to the media. 
number one priority, I think, in this thing is is making sure that he does not get you uh, early. You want to control that Seahawks running game early. I uh, kind of envision him trying to come out and trying to get the ball in Chris Carson's hand. And also, they don't. Even though uh, Russell Wilson, I don't think he's he, he's as keen as doing it as much as maybe in his early years. Kind of on those, you know, they'll give you a lot of those read option uh, mm-hmm. uh, kind of looks. But I don't know how how up. And he's, he, he'll keep it one or two times against the Steelers, I promise you. But I, I don't know how many times. What they'll probably do a lot of times with that is maybe boot Russell out off of it uh, and all like that. But, you know, you have to make sure that you keep somebody, you know, uh, uh, you know at home uh, guarding on that. And a lot of times when you pay mind a little bit to that read option, you're going to you're gonna set yourself up for maybe one of those uh, uh, gap opening up if, if Russell does hand the ball off to Carson. So you linebackers, are, Devin Bush are really going to have to be on, uh, on, on, on point in this one. But A, I think it does start with trying to shut down Chris Carson and get those guys into second and long situations right off the bat. I agree uh, wholeheartedly. This team ran, I think, 22 times on first and second down last week and only threw 11 in a pretty close competitive game where game circumstance wouldn't really change things too much. So that shows their com- commitment to the run game. Um, I agree. This this game on paper, at least, is much more in the Steelers' wheelhouse than the Patriots game. Obviously, New England's a team that'll spread you out, has no problem throwing it 50 times if they have to. Uh, Seattle really has to run the ball and run the ball effectively to, to be in rhythm and be on script as an offense. And the Steelers' run defense is still strong, and they were strong last week. I think they can they can you know handle uh, a good backfield that Seattle has with the read option stuff. Uh, the biggest thing is really almost in the corners because how do you defend read option? How do college teams defend read option? Generally speaking, you know eight man fronts, uh, eight man boxes. Uh, so that's going to leave corners on an island and, and make them have to man up. But that's probably the best way to do it to account for the unblocked read defender. Um, Wilson kept it twice last week on read options. They both came in the fourth quarter, so they're kind of in big moments where they let them carry the football. Like you said, they won't let them be as free to carry the football as maybe he used to be uh, now that he's gotten older and, and has that big money contract. But yeah, that's the bottom line is, you know, shut down the run game. It's not going to totally eliminate play action. Play action still works if your run game struggles. But if you do that, it'll certainly help. Um, and then just read your key. Linebackers are going to have to be really key here, reading low, low hat, high hat, knowing what the tendencies are for, for play action. A lot of first and 10 stuff, um, second and, and medium. Uh, if they do that, then they'll be in, be in good position. Unlike the Patriots, but uh, if you get Seattle in third and long situations, you really take play action out of it. <laughs> yeah, that's a good way to do it. You know, that that there. Here's what uh, Keith Butler has to say uh, about, uh, about uh, Chris Carson. Here. Uh, Chris Carson is a big man with dadgum. You know, I, I I'm from the South. We use a lot of dad gums down there, so <laughs> it doesn't it doesn't bother me as much as uh, it, it might a lot of pe- people. Carson is a big man with dad gum strong legs. He's hard to get on the ground. They have the team built for controlling the ball and stuff like that, keeping the offense. It's the stuff like that that bothers me sometimes <laughs> with Keith Butler. <laughs> Does he know what the stuff like that is? <laughs> uh, keeping the offense, uh, uh, keeping uh, the Steelers' offense off the field. Everything you think about old school football which is eat up the clock and stuff like there's another stuff like that time of possession turnovers and all that stuff uh maybe we should be worried about the stuff this week that (laughs) usually works out positive in the past and that is what they're trying to do so what we have to do number one is stop them running the ball and number two be effective when they go play action because how effective they are in play action is determined by how effective they are running the football i'm not necessarily in, in agreement with that you know my stance on that i I don't think running the ball good has anything to do with play action. I think uh, play action can work whether or not you run the ball good if you're in the right, right. down a distance situation there. We have to be able to do both. Get them in the th- get them in third down, get them in third long, and s- there's another stuff like that. And ultimately win win out uh, in, in, in in third down. Uh, out, uh, outside of the stuff stuff like that, I, I'm in agreement with Keith Butler. Yeah, I, I think it's uh, a much – not that it's easier necessarily, but a simpler approach to Seattle. I think they have a clearer identity and kind of a more one-track, this is what we got to do kind of mind, which most offenses have. There are exceptions like New England. Uh, in terms of the receiving game, you know, they got a couple like – a lot of young guys. Tara Lockett's now the number one guy after Doug Baldwin retired, but the guy you want to worry about is DK Metcalf, uh, who can be someone that, that wins one-on-one whenever they get one-on-one looks against single high and the safety's rotating away. 
they're going to throw some jump balls to him. And if he gets on really anyone, but especially if Joe Hayden can't play, uh, a guy like Artie Burns, a guy like Steven Nelson is going to be tested. And this is a guy that made big plays last week in his debut. He'll have averaged over 22 yards of catch on four receptions. So uh, a big play threat that can kind of change momentum of games really quickly. Going to have to deal with him. One was kind of a jump ball. Did you see that one, Tom? Kind of really an ill-advised the, pass. The 42-yarder? Which one do you know which uh, one you're not the, to? not the one deep because he, he did a good job actually of stacking that, that, that mm-hmm. corner uh, on, on the one down the left sideline. I'm talking about the other longish one. Uh, okay. that, uh, that he had in there. Go back and watch that one. You kind of see we're really, uh, I thought it was kind of an ill-advised pass uh, on that one. But, I mean, he is a guy that can out-muscle you uh, mm-hmm. in those situations. I don't know how deep you got into it, but kind of the thing that stuck out to me, and I, I kind of remember this, I think, at Ole Miss as well, too. I mean, we've got another kind of situation here, I think, kind of with the Steelers with James Washington uh, last year. Uh, James Washington came out of college as a predominantly right side uh, receiver. Uh, this it seems to be Metcalf's primarily just a left side guy. Uh, also, did you see them use Metcalf much in motion? I don't think so, right? Uh, mm-hmm. uh, on top of it, so I think I think you're going to see. Uh, I think they're they're trying to play the DK Metcalf strengths coming out of college, which they obviously should, and that means a left side guy. And I would be surprised if you see him much on the right side in this game. Not a not in an to me not an accomplished route runner, uh, but if he can get on top of you in a hurry. And if he does stack you, uh, stack your corner, then. You know, he if the ball's anywhere near him, he's got a good chance of 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 owning that one there. So, with even that said, I still kind of take my chances with him. I'm not sure even if Joe Hayden's healthy, Alex. You can give me your thoughts on him. I think uh, I think I'd want uh, uh, Joe Hayden on Lockett. Uh, I think I'd take my chances with with Metcalf with Steven Nelson on the other side, and I force Russell Wilson to beat me going to Lockett. Well, if Hayden, I mean not Lockett, uh, uh, Metcalf. Right. If Hayden plays, he's not going to shadow Metcalf. Obviously, if he's going to shadow anybody, it'll be Lockett. And so with Metcalf being a left side player, that means he'll be on the defense's right side, which means he'll see Steven Nelson. So you kind of naturally get that matchup anyway. Um, I, I, I did, agree. Did you, did you see that on the tape with him being a left side guy? Yeah, yeah, I got, you know, I, now that you think, now that you mention it, yeah, it does come to mind, uh, which is fair. Uh, but I will say is that he's stronger, more physical faster and already probably has as many receiving yards as James Washington did sure, last year. So sure. point point taken about him being left side, it doesn't make him easier to defend on those no. one-on-one jump balls. No. And he doesn't even have to be stacked to win. He can just go up there and he can win those 50-50 balls that some other receivers can't. So um, I understand what you're saying. It may limit them offensively in some ways, but you know if, they, if he's one-on-one, they're throwing it to him. They'll do it in the red zone. I think after that 42-yarder, they threw a fade to him that was incomplete in the end zone. So they'll, they'll throw a jump ball or two to him and the corner's got to contest. And they'll run. They'll they'll uh, they'll run those. They'll try to run those quick slants to him as well too. I think he mm-hmm. had one or two maybe uh, 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 of those as well too. But once again, though, he's not a he's not a very accomplished route runner. You know. Right. Yeah, you know what routes he's running, but when he's the freak that he is, sometimes you just can't stop it. That's the mark of a freaky player. He can get on top of you. Yeah, for sure. Anything else with Seattle's offense you want to address before we flip to the defense? Uh look, I mean Lockett. Uh... <sighs> You know what? What did he have? Three, three, two, two or three targets last week. Four targets, I think. Two, two. Okay. One catch. And the one catch was a blown. Mm-hmm. Forty-four yard touchdown blown uh, coverage. That was a blown coverage on that one there. Uh, hopefully Hayden can play, and hopefully, you know, I, I here's the thing. I, I think he can run a lot of zone in this, if defensively, mm-hmm. if, if you're the Steelers. Uh, I think, I think the biggest concern would be kind of the over routes with them. Yeah, off of play action. That was Yankee concepts post and over routes. Uh, Steelers have a good answer to it. They just didn't. They got to execute it. Where the safety comes down, takes the over, and the cornerback replaces as, as the deep safety. That's their adjustment and their check to it, which is good. Uh, they had miscommunication, though, last week that, that created some problems. I try to keep a lid on it a little bit more in this one. So I think you see a little bit more cover three, you know, kind, kind of. Say, and look, I want, I want Russell Wilson, if I play cover two, I, w- I want him to beat me with the whole shots. Yeah. Yeah, fair enough. Uh, you know what's interesting with the defense? You know, what, real, real no, quick, uh, uh, what do you well, think about their offensive line? Uh, it's better. 
Uh, Fluker's a, a good tackle. They're going with some six offensive linemen. George Fant, number 74, will come in as a tackle eligible. Uh, they got Dwayne Brown, Afedi. Uh, it, it's not great, but it's better than what it's been. Well, I'll be disappointed if uh, the Steelers' defensive line can't can't have a lot of wins in this one. Yeah. Oh, they should. I mean, they got to get a sack. You don't want to go two games without without a sack from from those guys up front. Oh, what I mentioned, uh, not for the Seahawks defense, though. I'll get to that in a second. But the Steelers' defense is crowd noise. It's another reason maybe why Devin Bush shouldn't have the green dot this week because I know we talk about home games and we think about okay, crowd noise won't be an issue, but it is for the defense because when does the home team get loud? It's when the opposing offense is on the field, and that affects the defense in the same way that it affects Seattle's offense. So, you know, communication was an issue last week, and now you're going into a home game where it's going to be loud, and you got to make sure you're communicating well there. And you probably can't do it as verbally as you could up in New England. So I know that sounds backwards, but when you think about how crowd noise actually works and, and when it's used, it actually has a negative impact on the Steelers' defense the way it would have a negative impact, ideally, on, Se- on the Seahawks' offense. All right, other side of the ball. Uh, good team. Well, I mean, I mean look, they're, they're, and here's the other thing with them yeah. too. I, we don't know uh, if that third, uh, who's who, is is Brown going to be Jerron Brown? I mean, mm-hmm. you know, look, they're going to have to try. I once again, I I think I want to make that Seattle offense, uh, big big play me through Metcalf, and uh, try to go to their number three receiver, whoever you know, whoever, whoever that's going to be. Yeah, I agree. And, and Lockett can get vertical. I mean, the other target he had was should have been a big 30 plus yard play. I think he kind of dropped it. So this is a guy that might not get a lot of looks, but when they do, he can make big plays out of them. With the Seahawks defense, it's a it's a really stout front seven. I, I know there are issues with the interior defensive line with no read and two and a Ford probably not playing in this one. But again, it's a deep defensive line with our old friend Al Woods manning the interior. Uh, they two gap well in the interior. They're a fast flow defense. They can you know defend perimeter runs. Uh, they got some great linebackers and Bobby Wagner, arguably a top two linebacker in football with Luke Geekley and KJ Wright. You know, Wagner did not come off the field once last week. Uh, Wright played 90 percent of the time. They got Michael Kendricks, who's a good athlete, too. Uh, Steeler fans wanted him uh, a while back. So this front seven is, is stout. And I haven't even mentioned uh, Clowney. So, like, they got a lot of talent up front. I think you got to stress those linebackers, though. How do you do that? In in this with some you get you got him a I'd like to see some play action a little bit with Ben uh in in, in this <laughs> one to try to get him to to take that step forward there. Uh I from what I saw from a defensive standpoint from the C- Seahawks, they seem to want to be more comfortable playing playing some zone stuff. Uh I think I think Vance McDonald could have a big game in this one. I, I want to try to get uh, Vance McDonald lined up on one of them linebackers or one of them safeties in this one, especially if a guy like Tedrick Thompson or something or, or someone doesn't play. I think this is an, uh, a, a game as well, too, that sets up for, for using your backs out of the backfield uh, with, uh, with with Connor. Uh, I, I want to st- stress those guys – those linebackers as much as possible, a couple RPOs, those kind of things there. Uh, their, their secondary isn't, isn't great. You know, it, it's uh, a really it. y- young secondary, which is, I thought the interesting part. I know their Steelers receivers are young, but let me just give you the ages of every Seahawks DB that played last week. I know Thompson may not play, but he's 24. Trey flowers is 24. Shaq Griffin is 24. Bradley McDougal is the elder at 28. Hugo Amadi, 22, is a rookie. And then Leon Hill is 23. So only McDougal is uh, older than 24 years old. So that's a young secondary that I think Ben's got to be able to take advantage of. I agree. And and uh, once again, I think they're <sighs> – look, they're, they're, they're... – the one thing that, that that I think stuck out to me with the uh, uh, with against the Bengals there was you know a guy like John Ross even had 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 some success against them there, and he even left a couple of plays on the field I thought mm-hmm. you know a couple of drops uh, when when it comes to that so once again you know they're obviously going to mix up coverages zone zone and man they seem to be more comfortable in zone at least in that one game, which isn't a lot to go on uh, in that. Uh, They can be thrown on, and they should be thrown on. Uh, I agree. Uh, Well, they're definitely a zone team. They're a cover three team. That's that's their shell. Uh, That's what the the hallmark of a Pete Carroll coach defense is, so that's not new what we saw last week. Um, But they don't just spa shop. They have Ripley's match, and they'll carry the seams. They do a good job there, so they they are able to handle some of the vertical concepts that a a, a true spa shop cover three is – 
uh, vulnerable to. The Steelers saw that in 2015 where they got, you know, just, just toasted down the seam time and time again. But they're a cover three team, so I'd be looking to hit them with 10-yard outs, get those corners to open up, playing off coverage, uh, some curl routes, some side adjustments against uh, looser coverage. And uh, I would still try to attack vertically too down the seam. So the, they're a cover three show most of the time. You kind of know what you're going to get. You should have a game, good uh, game plan for it. With the run game, I'm getting downhill. It's like playing Jacksonville. I'm not running perimeter. I'm not trying to get on the edge. They do have a tougher interior, but they're missing a couple guys. I want to get my guards and cover up these good linebackers. I don't want these guys to be able to play in space. I know what you said about trusting linebackers, and I get it, but I'm trying to not challenge Bobby Wagner and KJ Wright as much as possible. I'm just trying to kind of cover them up and take them away in their run game because they're they're great at what they do, and they will make plays if you challenge them enough. You want a seam here and a seam here. <laughs> yeah, and I want to get a power run and a duo block and uh, get to the second level. I'm not running perimeter. Uh, no, no more tosses, Randy. Not going to work. Uh, how many times did we see the guards full last week? Pittsburgh? Yeah. Their guards? Not much. A couple, <laughs> couple times, two, three times maybe. And, you know, look, but they, they, barely, they barely ran the ball. Right, had a chance to run right. Too. Uh, I'd like to see some power as well, too. I mean, I'm not, I'm obviously not opposed to that, uh, but I, man, change it up a little bit. You got to get Ben under center a little bit more, make, you know, uh, uh, a little bit more than what he's been doing. I think uh, I'd like to see a little bit of play action in this as well. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe being at home in a way helps with some of the crowd noise stuff to get him under center. And, and look, because of the, because of what's going on with them at safety and all too, I mean, I, I think you're going to see right off the shoot. I think you're going to see him try to draw them up with, I know people hate those wide receiver screens or whatnot, but a, I, I you know, I talked about the other day about get Dante Moncrief involved early in this one here. Uh, I, I, I come out, throw a wide receiver screen. If they're, if they're going to play off right away, I want to try to suck those, uh, suck them up a little bit, pay a little bit more attention to ki- kind of that, the, you know, those quick kind of outs, if you will, because if you can, then, then, you know, you got to take advantage on those one-on-one matchups on the outside and try to go vertical with a uh, guy like James Washington. You know, one receiver, I think that could really be a good matchup against Seattle secondary, Deontay Johnson. Uh, this, the Seahawks love their cover three. They like these big, long corners. Remember Richard Sherman, Brandon Browner. They got similar guys and Trey Flowers. Let me get that quick, speedy receiver that can run really good routes against these stiffer, taller, longer corners. As long as you can beat press coverage or, or be able to bunch things up so you can get a free release for Johnson, I think that's the guy that could win. So that's a sneaky guy that could have a bigger role than expected um, and, and maybe make some big plays. How much do you think they're going to play him in this one? I mean, I'm, I'm not quite sure, uh, but I think this is a matchup where you want him to get play time. Again, you may use four receiver sets to do it uh, against Trust, this younger secondary uh, on the road. Uh, I'd be all for that, but uh, I want to get him play time because I think he actually is a really attractive matchup when you're facing a guy like Trey Flowers, who I think is like 6'1", 6'2", 200 plus pounds, and, and give me the, the, the speedy receiver to run away from him. You know, here's the thing, too, I think, and you probably picked up on this well, too, The uh, even the Bengals uh, spread him out a little bit. Mm-hmm. And the other thing Tomlin mentioned, and this is an important point, is that this team wants to, to stay in their base 4-3 defense, Seattle does. And so I'm spreading things out. I'm going 11-4 receiver sets that's either going to force them out of base personnel and take some of those linebackers off of the field or keep them on the field, and I'm going to put them in, in stressful situations. So if you want to talk about stressing linebackers, I'm doing that by playing – you know, horizontally and putting these linebackers in space and forcing them to cover some tight ends and some receivers and make those plays in space, uh, and, and remove that, them from the box. Yeah. And that's yeah. where, and that's kind of where I was going with stride. I don't want them running on a perimeter. I, you know, I think yeah. you maybe took out of context what I was saying there. Uh, but you know, I, I, I do want them have to try to run vertically. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But there are good linebackers for sure. And they can make some plays. Uh, but, I mean, we're not, we're, we're not, we're not going to see a lot of two uh, two uh, two tight end sets probably in this one. Especially, I mean, you don't have a. You're probably not going to have a fullback. You're probably not going to use a fullback a lot one a lot in this one mm-hmm. either. Yeah, I mean, you may use it more. I mean, they only used it. Did they run any two tight end sets last week? Did they two? McGrimble played two snaps. It was it with those two tight ends. I didn't know if McGrimble I, came I in think, from McDonald in those plays. I think they were. Okay, but still, I mean, so you may many. see it more just because the bar is so low. But yeah, I, I think you want to spread things out and. Um, would displace those linebackers, and again, that helps open up the the run game by lightening that box a little bit. Look, they should have. There's there's no reason why this offense shouldn't have success against this defense. Yep, 
I agree. Uh, as long as they get the ball downhill and those receivers win their matchups, which they're capable of. Uh, either quick note for me, special teams, Tyler Lock in the return game, uh, at least punt return, I'm not sure he's doing kicks, uh, is always a threat. Then Michael Dixon, their punter, Seattle has this already one of the NFL's top punters. Uh, rookie last year, had a great season. He's a guy they can flip the field for you, um, so be aware of that. Uh, I don't know. Look, uh, you and I are both fans of Tyler Lockett. I mean, no, oh, yeah, big no, fan. No, uh, no, no surprise there. I just I got a funny feeling when you got Roosevelt Nix off the field and you got Nico Thorpe off the field, something's go, something's <laughs> gonna happen. Uh, I I just got that kind of that sixth sense that that somebody's gonna get a big return here. No. And hopefully it's the Steelers. The, the, side. the, be a the odds for, are it's not the Steelers because yeah. of the last couple of years have gone. Sight for sore eyes if 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 if, if that happens. Yeah. All right, Dave, any other final thoughts here with this one, looking at Seattle? No, I mean, I think when you look at the, at who might be available for both teams and you look at schematically what we think might happen, I mean, the Steelers should should uh, you know should have, should have the advantage on both sides of the football here. I agree. Much, much better on paper this time than they were this time a week ago against New England. I uh, mean, so, and, and, and also, this is not a Seahawks. I mean, look, I, I would – I would try maybe to to see if the Steelers come out some man coverage, but this is just not as as, as well oiled uh, of an offense to to do some of the things that or a lot of the things that Tom Brady did. Oh yeah, you know with with those picks and those underneath and all. They might try, but they're just they're they're not built to do that. Yeah, the running backs are more involved in the pass game, but they're not James White. They're not Rex Burkhead. They're not going to win one-on-one battles the way that those guys could. So, again, on paper, Steelers are in a much better place than they were against New England. Agreed. All right, Dave, uh, before we get to our picks for the week across the league, you are, are already 1-0 on me on the week there picking Carolina. Uh, let's talk about our friends over at my bookie. Yeah, Alex, if you found $100 on the street, would you pick it up or keep on walking? Of course you'd take the money. <laughs> so why do you why do you keep picking winners and not betting on them? That's why I go to my bookie. It's fast, it's easy, and they pay when you win. Let's face it. Where you're betting at is just as important as who you're betting on. I wouldn't be telling you guys to bet with my bookie AG if they weren't the best in the business. Do the smart thing. If you're going to bet this football season, bet with my bookie. Did you know you could bet on games after kickoff? If by the second half it looks like your bet is going to lose, you can always take the other side of it with my bookie. If you're the kind of guy or girl that likes to bet a little and win a lot, try a parlay. You pick multiple teams. If all your picks come in, you multiply your winnings. And no matter how you bet, the NFL season is the best time of year to do so. If you join right now, my bookie will double your first deposit. Use promo code TERRIBLE to activate this offer, however. That's promo code TERRIBLE. Visit mybookie.ag today. You play, you win, you get paid. And I got paid last night. I had the uh, Buccaneers plus seven. You had Carolina minus seven. That was kind of an interesting game, especially the final few plays there. It was boring until the end, and uh, Carolina, what a mess. Cam Newton does not look healthy, does he? No, he doesn't, I, and that might, uh, even though uh, Ron Rivera seems to, uh, wants to dismiss all that right after the game and all like that, <laughs> you need what, uh, uh, how, how far did they, not even a yard, on, I mm-hmm. don't think, on, on that on that last play there, just take Cam up over the top. He's, how many times has he done that? And, before during his career and the fact that you don't have the confidence to do that i think that says a lot yep speaks volumes okay let's get to our picks all right let's get to our picks here we'll start with uh the indianapolis colts at the tennessee titans the titans are laying three on this one at home oh yeah tennessee that defense looks legit uh that offense you know was better than what i thought this one's tough the colts battle back against the chargers came up a little short I'm going to I'm going to buy into the Tennessee hype a little bit. That's a really strong defense across the board. Give me Tennessee. I think I, I'm with you on that one as well, too. Tennessee at home uh, right there. I think uh, I think Vrabel's doing a great job with that team right now. Mm-hmm. Colts, uh, the Colts did uh, uh, give uh, who was it? the the, uh, the Chargers. Chargers, right? You know, a little bit everything that they wanted to. I, I uh, kind of a letdown week for them. Give me Tennessee uh, minus the three. I'm with you. The, speaking of the Chargers, they're on the road against the Detroit Lions. 
Uh, Lions plus two at home uh, on this one. Mm, yeah, not a game uh, I would I would probably uh, pick uh, if I if I had to pick on it. Um, Lions almost blew that that lead to Arizona, uh, and then that tie. Chargers almost blew the lead to, to the Colts had the win in overtime. I'm gonna go with the Chargers on this one, but I'm not feeling too good about this game. Yeah, I I, I feel a little bit more comfortable on this one than, than maybe you do. I, I you know even though they're coming uh, you know west coast east coast here, I, I like the lot the charger on it. I think I think this is uh this might be Dave's stone cold lock of the Ooh. century of the week right here. Minus are you are you all in on Austin Eckler or something? Is that where it's coming uh, from? Look, I, I, I make no mistake, they lost Hunter Henry again. Poor kid. Right. Yeah. Awful. I, I mean, and and they're already uh, lost the. Uh, uh, Derwin James for a little bit uh, here, mm-hmm. so injuries are not kind uh, to the Chargers so far here this uh, uh, this season. And make no mistake, let's see the Chargers play the Steelers. What week six is it? Is uh, it? In 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 L. A. There, so that's something to pay attention to there. Uh, I I still like the Chargers to cover this, cover this easily. Uh, so I'm laying the two with you. Buffalo Bills at the New York Giants. Uh, ooh. You want to talk one that, that, that screams, I don't know. Uh, Giants plus one and a half at home. Yeah, oh, it's only plus one and a half against the Bills. Kind of tells you where the Giants are at. Uh, but Buffalo blowing that lead to the Jets, which the Jets are another mess we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, give me the Bills just because that defense might be the most underrated defense in all of football. They just don't give up the big play, and I don't trust Eli Manning and even with Barkley there to nickel and dime them their ways down the field. So I think Buffalo still like Josh Allen. Um, you know, they did get up a big lead on the Jets. Give, give me give me Buffalo to, to win this one. I'm just going to go with the more experienced quarterback in this one. I'm going to go with Eli, the, the, the fighting Eli Manning <laughs> on there. Look, Saquon, I, is there a more exciting back right now? No, nah, yeah, he's he's the best. Uh, man, but the Bills he, just don't allow big plays. They keep a lid on things. Yeah, if if uh, I think Saquon might be able to get loose for one or two in this one. Give me the Giants at home plus that point and a half. Uh, I sure would like that one to move to two. But uh, regardless, mm-hmm. uh, Arizona Cardinals. Oh, Arizona Cardinals on the road against the uh, the Baltimore Ravens, who really looked uh, really looked good against a bad uh, Miami Dolphins team uh, last week. Uh, the Ravens are laying 13 in this one. Oof, big line for sure. But uh, I'm going to – man, I mean, Baltimore's obviously going to win this game. I mean, that's not the difficult part of the, the, this prediction. It's, you know, can the Cardinals cover? I don't think they do. I mean, I know that's a, that's a huge line with that Baltimore defense is no joke against Kyler Murray. I know they kind of picked it up late in the fourth quarter, and he came back, and there will be better days ahead. But I think Baltimore wins by 17. Yeah, who's the defensive coordinator? Wink. Uh, Martindale. Uh, Martin. <laughs> uh, Martindale over there. I think he's going to have more than enough to handle the Cardinals' offense uh, in this one. The Cardinals got to get a ball in David Johnson's hands just as many times as they possibly can. But I think if they get down in this one, they're going to have to get away from that. You, are you saying that because he's on a fantasy team of yours or something? Uh, I got like reading? twenty six. He's on. Oh, yeah, he's on <laughs> everybody's on. You're on one of my fantasy teams, I think, Alex. Uh, <laughs> uh, give I'm me a the flex ra- spot. <laughs> Give me the Ravens lay the big number in this one here. You want to talk about another big line, Alex? The New England Patriots on the road (laughs) against the Miami Dolphins. Oh, Lord. Uh, Patriots uh, or Dolphins plus 19 and a half in this one at home. 19 and a half. Here's where I'll go with Miami to cover uh, because they always play them tough. We had the Miami Miracle last year, and I just don't think they can look that bad two weeks in a row. I think they'll be more focused in playing a Patriots team, wanting to play spoiler. This is basically their Super Bowl, <laughs> as close as the Dolphins are going to get this year. So uh, my, New England's going to win, but Miami covers. Speaking of that New England team, uh, where was it here? At this point, NFL will not place Antonio Brown on the commissioner exempt list as there is no criminal investigation making him eligible to play Sunday versus Miami per sources. Uh I, to me, I think New England's just going to be way, 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 way too tough here for them. So give me, uh, give me New England, lay that big. No, no, no Miami mm. miracle uh, uh, mm-hmm. this week here. I'm, I'm, a, I'm laying some big numbers this week here. Yeah. Uh, Dallas Cowboys at Washington Redskins. Uh, Dallas, boy, Dallas didn't look too half, half bad. Uh, Washington at home. It looks like uh, uh, Geis uh, down for a while here. Yep. Uh, Let's see, plus six, the Redskins at home. 
Nah, give me Dallas. Kellen Moore uh, might be the best team that offense has had in a long, long time. Uh, just a, a world of difference an offense coordinator makes. Uh, that defense is, isn't half bad. And uh, with Washington, I mean, who are they going to throw to? Who are they going to give the ball to? I mean, you just had Jay Gruden talking about just throwing Peterson under the bus, basically saying, you know, we didn't have him active last week because we didn't plan on running the ball 55 times. So, and now he's your guy. So, uh, it just feels so dysfunctional over there in Washington. Dallas is on the right track. Dallas wins by 10. I tell you, the back they need to use more, Chris Thompson. Uh, out, yeah, out, well, out, he will. Out, yeah. Third down guy. Yeah. Out, out of the backfield there, even though I, I don't think that's enough. Give me the Cowboys on the road, latest six points. Jacksonville Jaguars on the road against the Houston Texans. Uh, whew, uh, uh, Minshew at quarterback there. Uh, Texans laying eight and a half at home. Wow. I mean, do you believe in the Gardner Minshew hype or was that just uh, beginner's luck? Uh, that's the oldest looking rookie quarterback I've ever seen in my entire life. Um, he was like, I'm such a big Deshaun Watson fan. Uh, it's 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 a it's a shame that Houston lost last week after that defensive play calling. I think what's the line on this one? Houston's favored by how much? Eight and a half. Eight and a half. Yeah, that's a big line. I think divisional game. Give me Houston the win, but Jackson was going to cover. Yeah, I think I, uh, I I think Houston's just going to be too much for the for the young quarterback in this one as well too. I think it comes down to that late eight and a half uh, with the Texans there. Uh, San Francisco at at Cincinnati. Uh, Cincinnati's offense looked a little bit better, uh, especially their. I mean, look, their offensive line wasn't great, but uh, it looked a little bit better what I, what I thought it might uh, look like there. Laying one and a half at home against the 49ers. This one's a tough one to to kind of decipher here. Yeah, give me the Bengals, though. Again, a difference that a good you know, coach or offensive background of mine like Zach Taylor can bring. Uh, really, I thought the Bengals were a lot more flexible and a lot more varied and unpredictable than they had been under the stagnant era that Marvin Lewis uh, was. So long story short, give me the Bengals. Uh, can, can the Bengals really uh, get I mean, win, win this game at home? Yes, they can. Will they? I don't think they will. Give me the 49ers plus a point and a half. Minnesota Vikings on the road against the Green Bay Packers. Packers at home laying two and a half. Uh, yeah, Minnesota's got that, that old school philosophy. They only threw the ball, what, 10 times last week? I think dropped back 11. I like Green Bay, though. I've always been been a big fan. Uh, that defense, again, talk about improved defenses. Be a close game. I'm going Green Bay. I'm going Green Bay as well, too. At home, yeah. Uh, yeah. Rodgers and, and all that. Later, later two and a half in, in this one. Kansas City against Oakland, who didn't look uh, all that too terribly bad against uh, Denver there. But uh, Kansas City on the road, uh, laying seven and a half. Uh, yeah, uh, the Raiders looked, also lost uh, the rookie uh, safety as well, too. Yeah, Jonathan Abram, uh, hard-nosed player, but that was kind of the concern. He was really, really reckless and could be injury-prone in that sense. Uh, Oakland looked good. Credit to, to them for focusing, uh, even without dealing with the A-B stuff, not having him out there. But give me Kansas City. Mahomes just just unstoppable. Uh, Kansas City's going to win by two touchdowns. Yeah, I, I don't know if they'll win by that big, but I have no no problem with them uh, covering that seven and a, seven and a half at the uh, uh, in in the black hole there. Okay, what do we have next? All right, Alex, next up, uh, New Orleans Saints at the Los Angeles Rams. Rams laying two. This ought to be a, this one uh, you should have on your TV in the afternoon. Yeah, that'll be a really good game. Uh, ooh, that one is tough. I'm going to I'm gonna lean the Saints in this one. I don't feel particularly confident about it, but it'll be a heck of a game. I just worry about that, that Rams run game with Gurley and his issues. I mean, they got some depth there with Brown and, and Henderson, but I'm going to go with the Saints. Oh, I've taken a lot of road teams, I think, in this. I'm going to take the Rams at home uh, to to uh, to get after Drew Brees and company. I'm not very confident on this one. Lay in the two with the Rams at home. Chicago Bears at the Denver Broncos. Uh, the Bears, of course, lost in week one to the Packers. They got a little bit of extra time to, pre- to uh, prepare there. Denver obviously lost uh, to uh, the Raiders here. Uh, the Bears lay in two and a half on the road in Denver. You know, tough place to play, too. It is a tough place to play, but it's a lot easier when you got to face that Broncos offense that hasn't done much and a defense that didn't look like uh, the, the Broncos defense that we've come to know 
uh, on Monday night against Oakland. So give me Chicago. I know Trubisky's been an issue, but I think he'll have a, a bounce back game. I think the I think defense is maybe the uh, the deciding factor in this one, and with the Bears having the better one, I, uh, at least on paper, I, I'm with you. Give me the road Bears laying the two and a half. Philadelphia. Let's see. This one's the Sunday night game. Philadelphia on the road against the Atlanta Falcons. Uh, Falcons plus two at home. Plus two. Wow. I mean, I know they looked terrible last week. I'm going to go Philadelphia. I know they got off to that super slow start. What found themselves down 17 nothing. But um, the only concern I had with Philadelphia is that interior defense line and what Malik Jackson lost for the year. But that Falcons run game has to show something. Freeman struggled. They lost Chris Lindstrom with a broken foot, so they have issues too. Uh, I'm going to go Philadelphia by a touchdown. I'm going to pull the shocking upset here. Ooh. Uh with with this, I'm gonna take Atlanta at home to win this one outright. So give me the two points here, uh, boy. The Monday night game, uh, Cleveland Browns uh, at, at at the Jets and Sam Darnold expecting to miss this one with the mono. Uh, evidently, uh, Bill Belichick sent Demarius Thomas over there. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little a little bio warfare. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, sad to see Darnold uh, have to miss time here. Uh, be because of that, you know, probably going to be the difference in the game. Uh, Browns laying six and a half on the road. Boy, if the Browns lose this one on the road, woo wee. Uh, I'll be rooting for the Jets, but uh, my money says uh, lay to six and a half. Yeah, I'm with you on this one. Cleveland can't look that bad two weeks in a row. Trevor Simeon, uh, quarterback, even Le'Veon Bell dealt with a minor shoulder thing. He should play, but who knows if he's exactly at 100% on Rory just in the week two. And he's going to have to touch the ball a lot. So we'll see how his health is the rest of the way. But give me Cleveland in this one. All right. That brings us to the C. I think we've got all of them here, right? Uh, Seattle uh, at Hinesfield against the Steelers. The Steelers right now, according to my bookie.ag, laying three and a half at home. The over-under on this one's 47. Uh, wow. Okay. Um, I'm going to go with Pittsburgh in this one. I think it's, the, again, like I said earlier, it's, this game is very much more in the wheelhouse as opposed to New England. Seattle wants to be a ball control, run oriented attack and still this front seven and the run defense has still always been strong. I think they can help shut that down. Uh, force those young receivers to win. Like I said, that Seattle secondary is young. The interior defensive line is missing some pieces. Should be able to establish the run game better than you could a week before playing at home. Historically, this team does well in bounce back performances. Daniel Valente covered that earlier in the week. So I think the stars are aligning uh, for this team to uh, bounce back. I have Pittsburgh winning 23 to 14. So a bit of a lower scoring game, but a win nonetheless. Uh, I have the Steelers scoring the same amount of points as you do, 23. And look, I think, uh, I, you know, both sides of the football, the Steelers should be the better team. Uh, I, I think this one, obviously playing it at home should help on, on top of that. Uh, you know, as long as they don't give up any big plays, you know, Keith Butler always talks about that 16, 17 magic number. I think it comes in right around that. So I have the Steelers winning this one 23 to 17, uh, at home. Now the question becomes, uh, what is the narrative? Does it matter how the Steelers, what, in what fashion the Steelers lose this? Should they lose it? What is the narrative coming out of it? What if, what if this ends up being a, I don't know, a uh, uh, 16 to 10 loss for the uh, Steelers? Does that, how, how will the narrative go uh, versus, you know, uh, a, 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 a little bit higher scoring but losing maybe by a field goal? No, I think it's the same regardless of, of, if, of outcome and how it's lost, if it is a loss, to start 0-2, to then go to San Francisco on the West Coast. I mean, uh, the, the numbers for teams that start 0-2 and, and make the playoffs, uh, the history is not good. So you know, you don't want to call these things must-wins, but we know what the history says uh, of teams 0-2. I don't think an 0-2 team has ever gone on to win a Super Bowl. Uh, I think Daniel has some, some numbers on that, and the playoff rates are, are pretty low. So regardless of how it happens, uh, the narrative uh, will be the same, and it won't be positive, obviously, if this team loses. It won't be pretty, us having to talk about another loss uh, nope. ne- next week. And look, no, it's not a must-win game, but it's, a, it's one they must win. <laughs> yeah, it's a it's a critical game. <laughs> if, if if that makes any no no, there will be no post on 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 SteelersDepot.com this weekend saying this is a must win for the Steelers. But uh, man, you're right. You don't want to go into a West Coast trip, zero and two. Uh, I mean, look, this is is this is kind of perceived the toughest part of the schedule. A good quarterback in Russell Wilson, but 
make no mistake about it, this this should be a game that the Steelers win. And I had, like I said, I had this one 23-17 Steelers. Yep, and I got 23-14 Steelers. All right. Uh, where to from now? Uh, some reader emails. Close out the show. All right. Uh, Joshua Dicker, uh, Dicker writes in, Hey, guys, I hear y'all talking a lot about personnel groupings. Please forgive my ignorance on this one, but can you explain the, di- uh, the different personnel groupings like 11 personnel, 12 personnel, and 22 personnel? Thanks. Uh, I can take this one. Yeah, no, no. Uh, I appreciate the question. Anytime you want clarification, uh, more than happy to, to help out. Basically, the numbers just refer to the numbers of running backs and tight ends on the field. So, for example, in 21 personnel, that would mean that there are two running backs, a running back or a fullback, or two true running backs, and one tight end on the field. And that tells you how many receivers are on the field. It means there's two receivers on the field and 11 personnel, one running back, one tight end. It means there's three receivers on the field. You can have five of uh, the eligibles there. Um, so that's just kind of how, how that works. So the first number always means number of running backs. The second number means number of tight ends. And those numbers combined tell you how many receivers are on the field. And with uh, the Steelers, sometimes we actually use the zero personnel grouping, which means zero running back, zero tight ends, five wides on that. I think we had an instance or three of the zero one. Uh, this past mm-hmm. week uh, uh, as well. So, uh, yeah, that's a good question. You know, sometimes we don't pay. We, we've, we've talked about it before, but sometimes we get new listeners to the show and we don't, you know, so it's always good to kind of uh, go back over stuff like that. Thanks for the question, Joshua. Uh, Andre, let's see. David L. writes in. Hi, David and Alex. Sunday's game against the Patriots brought about a lot of discussion over reaction on the interwebs about Tomlin's future in Pittsburgh. I think Tomlin's record speaks for itself to Super Bowl appearances, zero losing seasons, and he's been dealt some underwhelming rosters since our last Super Bowl appearance. People throw out the he's had a Hall of Fame quarterback while he's been there argument, but Sean Payton has had Breeze, a better overall quarterback than Ben in my book for his entire tenure as head coach, but has only uh, has only one Super Bowl appearance and four losing seasons. Andy Reid has two playoff wins in six seasons in Kansas City, despite having some impressive rosters even before he had Mahomes. The point is not to disparage those guys. They had they are great head coaches, but rather that that winning consistently and contending for Super Bowls is just as just harder than than some fans realize. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I think you're on on, on track there, David. Uh, anyways, discussion I was reading for uh, got me thinking. When looking at Mike Tomlin's success as a head coach, what are the specific things that he has control over in his role that we can actually hold him accountable for? What are the things that fall more under the jurisdiction of Colbert, Feetner, and Butler uh, that fans blame Tomlin for. Obviously, he has control over decisions like clock management challenges and whether to go forward on fourth and one. I'd be interested to hear you touch on things like overall game plan, play calls, personnel, uh, obviously more more Colbert's job, but what influence does Tomlin have hiring, firing of coordinators, penalties, etc.? Wow. Uh, look, he, he, here's the thing. Head coaches should be held accountable for everything that happens uh, mm-hmm. uh, in, 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 in season. So that's kind of probably a, I don't know, I mean, a short answer to a, to a long question there. Uh, Colbert, obviously, I, I would think Tomlin has some say in, in, in the draft process, right? Oh, yeah. sure. It's a collaborative effort between those two guys. Right. So, I mean, but uh, as far as, you know, look, Colbert turns this team over to Col- uh, uh, to Tomlin, you know, at, at the start of the season there, you know. Uh, now, it, 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 as far as other things like trades and stuff like that, obviously Colbert in, in, in mm-hmm. charge there. But as, you know, hiring, firing of, of, of coordinators, I think AR2 probably has a little bit of, hand in that, as does Colbert. I don't know. Give, give him the kind of answer you might be looking for, Alex. No, I mean, I think you hit on it. It, it. It's tough to know specifically because we're not inside that room. I'm sure that Tomlin has a big role in the 50 man roster construction. I'm sure Colbert has some impact there, but I think it's really Tomlin's discretion is to, to choose his guys is going to make the 50 man roster, whereas Colbert has probably more pull in the offseason, a little bit more sway in the in the draft room, but again, it is a collaborative thing. And and then, yeah, I mean, sure, you know, Tomlin isn't making the play calls and those things fall on feet and responsibilities to, to, goes on those guys, but, you know, as you said, Dave, Tomlin's the head coach. 
buck stops with him. You know, he's the one that hired and, and helped hire and, and decide on uh, and keeping guys like Feetner and, and Butler. So if they screw up, it's going to be a reflection on, on Mike Tomlin. So he's going to be responsible for anything that happens. That's just territory of being a head coach. Absolutely. It all, it, uh, the buck stops there, if you will, there. Uh, yep. Let's see. Dustin Stover writes in, first-time emailer. All right. Thanks, Dustin. Uh, hey, Dave and Alex, Dustin here from Charleston, West Virginia. Long-time listener, first time writing into the podcast. Love the work you guys do. Thank you, Dustin. Uh, question. Recently read a report stating <laughs> Mika Fitzpatrick has been granted permission from the Dolphins to explore the trade. Would you guys think that there would be maybe some possible interest there, given the need – for playmaking in the secondary, coupled with his age, pedigree, and play on the field thus far, what would your guesstimation Colbert would realistically give up in draft capital in order to acquire someone like Fitzpatrick? Dustin, if you made it this far in the show, I think we answered your question. Yeah, I understand. It'd be nice. Uh, just don't don't count on it. Uh, Brett. Brett. Uh, buddy Brett from San Angelo, Angelo Texas. Brett. Uh, Brett is quite the writer here. I know you've probably been about A-B'd out, but I do have another angle that I was curious about. Do you think the issue with A-B split from the Steelers' mental health, et cetera, will help the Hall of Fame chance for Heinz Ward? Quick answer, no. <laughs> had no. things uh, had things not gone sideways, A-B was going to, going to hold all the team's receiving records and would have been considered the greatest receiver in Steelers' history. With all the drama, I don't think the media or the fan base would accept that now. I think that that title, as well as the records, now falls back to Heinz Ward. It may not get him into the hall. In my opinion, he should be there without that. I disagree with you. I think Alex does as well, maybe one day down the line. But I think uh, that's uh, that's my interjecting there. But I think it's bound to help. Thoughts? I think you're wrong, Brett. <laughs> uh, what AB does or didn't do or might do or whatever has no bearing in shitting on, on Heinz Ward's Hall of Fame chances. Love the podcast. Appreciate that you are level not getting too low after a loss and not too high after when I personally expected the loss to the Patriots. And I don't think it would would be close. Didn't expect the blowout, but it's thinking 10 points. Uh, you're right to point out that this was their toughest game, etc. I would like to say something that will not be popular with this schedule. I could see this team going two and four in their first six games. I can then see them going eight and two in their last 10 and finishing the year 10 and six and still winning division. If they finish the three and three in the, in the first six games, they will win the division period. Thanks for great work and podcast. Uh, oh, Brett's the one coming to, uh, to Vegas. So I'm going to have to, hopefully this is not another reason for him to, uh, to punch me in the face. Uh, I, I hope not either. I do wonder though, you know, I didn't think this would be the case for the longest time, but with the more and more things that happen with AB, does everything that's transpired with him this off season and, and, and the start of the regular season, does that hurt his, his personal hall of fame chances? Um, Obviously on talent, he should get in, but like, is there going to be a breaking point with, with the voters? I mean, Terrell Owens got in, right? I it mean, took a, it took a while. Yeah. But I mean, it, it, he's a great damn receiver. What he did in those last, what, six, seven years, man. Unreal. Oh sure, sure. No, I get it. But Owens, I mean, I, I think he felt. Are you saying should because, his off, should the off the field stuff matter here? I'm saying it will. Will it matter? And I think the more that this stuff happens, I think the closer we get to, yeah, it may affect his chances. I mean, in terms of like getting in, especially because like on on paper he's a first ballot Hall of Famer. I think we both agree on that in terms of just on field what he's done. But is the off the field stuff going to alter that? I and mean, maybe he won't get in as early as he might have. You know, I've never been a fan of taking the off-field stuff into account. But you know they do. I'm not saying, you know, right. should it. I'm just saying will it. And Owens, it clearly did so much. He didn't show up at the ceremony, correct, Owens? Right, right. Because he was felt slighted by being snubbed for all those years. Might he not be first ballot because? Uh, I think it's, it's possible, I suppose. Yeah. Okay, that's, that's what, basically what I'm asking. I mean, I guess it depends, too. I mean, what, what class are we talking about? Who's he going up against? Yeah. That that kind of thing there. So, right, and how does the rest of his career pan out? Uh, but, but none of this has anything to do with Heinz Ward, correct? Yeah, he doesn't change his status at all. Speaking of which, I guess we should uh, point out that uh, Troy Palomalo, uh, Heinz Ward, Alan Fanica, Gary Anderson, uh, James Ferrier, and Casey Hampton uh, are all part of the 100, what was the list, 122 modern era 
uh, guys up for the Pro Football Class of 2020. Uh, the only two that have a chance, uh, obviously Troy, and Troy should be a first ballot guy. Hard to imagine Troy not getting in first ballot. I think the only question comes down is, man, is it finally, <laughs> will they finally open up the door and let uh, uh, Alan Fanica in this time? He 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 should be in, you know. Yeah, two Steelers in one year, though. I don't know if they're, they're going to let that happen, unfortunately, because I mean, Troy's you, getting in. Troy's getting in, right? Yeah, he should be. If he's not first ballot, like we riot, like that's criminal. Yeah, uh, uh, I mean, and look, I mean, I think Fanica's weight has gone long enough. Uh, uh, Ward's not getting in this time. Hampton's not. Uh, Hampton's never, never going to get in. God bless him. I wish, uh, wish they had stats for for two gapping. <laughs> 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 you know, uh, and Ferrier obviously not going to get in, and Gary Anderson probably not going to get in uh, either. There. Uh, let's see here. Let's do uh, one more. So we're running along. Okay. Mm, try to find a good one here. Ryan Switzer from Chris Wade. Hey guys, long time listener. I never really had a question until I heard Alex say on a pre he's coming after you, Alex. No, uh, no. Say on a previous episode that he likes Ryan Switzer as a punt returner. My question is for Alex. What does Ryan Switzer offer as a punt returner that Eli Rogers doesn't offer? Plus Eli Rogers is a better route runner and much more threat in the passing game. Ryan Switzer is no threat on special teams. He doesn't even try to fit flip the field for us if he does get a chance to return a kick he usually just runs for the sideline like he's afraid of contact and even his decisions to field or fair catch uh, kicks is shaky he did it all last year and i saw more of it uh more of that against new england what do you honestly like about ryan switzer's returner deontay johnson is a better option or holton i just don't see ryan looking for a running lane and attacking the aggression that is needed for a punt returner he just heads for the sidelines and is okay with minimum yardage gains i just don't see why the Steelers value uh see value in him or anybody else for that matter just an, an, uh, just my observation and opinion well, this won't be an answer that you like, unfortunately, but it's it's accurate to say he's not dynamic the way that, you know, some other big name returners are, but they trust him. I think trust is the most important trait you got to have in your returning guy. Trust to make good decisions. I disagree. I think he makes good decisions in the punt return game. Trust in ball security. Trust in having good posture on each punt. Um, trust in taking care of the football, not fumbling in a, when you're getting tackled. And and I think he's shown a little bit of something. Even a return against New England last week, he spun out of a tackle. There was a missed block and had to get around a bounce by the kicker and, and, and got a decent gain out of, that, out of that, made a guy miss. So, I mean, there's been some moments there. I want to see how he does with a full gear in the system but just overall um, I agree he's not going to be an explosive guy I want to see bigger returns for sure I've been critical of this kick return game in general but uh, security and trust are two things that Switzer I think offers and I don't think there's any debate about that all right, uh, one more because Tamir, we missed Tamir's email the other day, and he even sent me another one to bump it up for the Friday podcast. Tamir writes in, what's up, uh, team? Just got done listening to Monday's session and appreciate you guys for tempering a lot of initial reactions. I bet everyone and myself had. Uh, it's week one, of course, and this team has major room for improvement, particularly on offense. I'd like to highlight the identity. The identity feature is trying to establish. I saw a whole lot of East and West BS, including the tosses, and also plenty of short yardage throws, expecting our wide receivers to make some moves after the catch. Do you see Randy moving forward, moving towards a more vertical approach, or does this recipe just need to need a bit more time to come to fruition? As for defense, I'd like to know your thoughts on how you would like to, how you would have liked to combat the Patriots' man-beating plays, especially in 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 uh, if front four can't get home love y'all keep up uh, the great work here uh, as far as your answer to the offense look uh, uh, the answer to the entire question is it's week one and it was the patriots mm-hmm. that's where we start let's let's give this a little bit of time here alex and i talked how we think this team should offensively maybe be able to get a little bit more vertical this week and on top of it, they should be able to run the ball better on top of it you know yeah not not so much uh, sideline the sideline those crack tosses or whatnot but up the gut uh and because of uh, the uh uh expect a lot of zone cover three from the seahawks defense you know yeah they should be able to to uh, you know attack the intermediate levels a little bit more shouldn't be a lot of these short passes and hope for for yak situations there so let's 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 just watch what happens this week against the Seahawks here uh what would you do uh, differently against the Patriots for the man beaters um yeah that one's tough for sure I, the, really the bottom line is not putting yourself in third and short as a defense because when you're in third and short they're going to run those rub route rub, rub routes they're going to run slant flat um where they can pick up four or five yards you put them in third and eight plus 
they want to run that short concept and pick up five, that's fine. They'll still punt. So like the best thing is to try to not put yourself in those situations in the first place. But just being aware of communicating, uh, like you said, they may be banjoing some calls and passing stuff off instead of trying to play trade up man to man. But yeah, just trying to not put yourself in that situation in the first place is probably the best way to, to deal with it. All right, uh, that's got all the uh, that's knocked out. I think all the questions this week. Uh, in the meantime, Alex and I will be. We look. We got a lot of more pregame content coming up on SteelersDepot.com uh, throughout the weekend. Here, uh, Alex and I, of course, will be back on Monday uh, with a podcast recut recapping what we hope is the Steelers win over the Seahawks. Uh, and in the meantime, you can follow me on Twitter at Steelers Depot. Follow Alex on Twitter at Alex underscore Kazora. Follow the show at Terrible Podcast. Email the show the Terrible Podcast at gmail.com. Keep those first time uh, uh, first timer emails coming at us. We love to hear from the first timers as well too. Uh, if you like what we do and want to donate to the cause, go to steedersdepot.com and hit the donate button up right navigational bar. Also, uh, if you want an ad free version of steedersdepot.com, go to steedersdepot.com and hit the ad free button up right navigational bar. Twenty five dollars for a calendar year, you can get an ad free version of the site until Monday. As always, thanks for listening to the Terrible Podcast with Dave and Alex.